Welcome to part six of my collection videos. Hopefully I'll be able to get through the entirety of the rest of my, I guess, general manga. I will do a part seven, which has my BL manga, but this should mainly be able to wrap up fairly quickly. So hopefully this video isn't too long in comparison to the other ones. Um, and this particular bookcase actually um, it's a little bit different from my previous bookcases just in make and size and everything else um, and I've actually put majority of the titles here are some of my absolute favorites um, they're all complete for the most part and ones that I absolutely adore so up the top we have the Viz Big editions of Vagabond volumes 1 to 5 and then 7 to 12 I do have volume 6 but uh, my sister's boyfriend is borrowing it. He's reading it right now. So um, really, really great series. This is a fictionalized retelling of the presumed life um, biography of uh, Musashi, who is a very well-known and famous swordsman. Um, and it's a little bit of an interesting thing because uh, a lot of people it's not quite confirmed that he was a singular person if that makes sense I think a lot of people recognize that historical figures because of just how history used to be preserved and word of mouth and these characters who do become sort of legendary in their countries there's always a, a line between like what's true what's not true this manga is based off of the novelization of his biography that was written many, many, many years ago. And this particular manga, like um, majority of Inoue's manga, is on hiatus. I don't know if we'll ever pick up and see more volumes. There's 37 volumes in the singles completed. So this collects the first 36, so it's their three in ones. I don't, I haven't um, actually got the 37th volume because I expect we may see some more volumes down the line and I would prefer to, you know, have, have a, you know, Viz Big 13 versus, um, you know, a bunch of singles. And I'm not really in a huge rush to complete this series as well, if that makes sense. Uh, but really, really wonderful um, Musashi as per expected is a very um intriguing intriguing individual this is de about his sort of personal journey and the idea of being a swordsman and a, being a true swordsman and also sort of the um transition to uh <laughs> non-weaponized combat if that makes sense like martial arts things like that there's a lot of really interesting things that if you are in uh, particularly focused on this individual or this period of history or this type of topic I would recommend it it's fairly engaging I like a majority of the characters um, but you guys know I'm a big fan of historical fiction anyway I don't own a lot of Inoue's work although I would like to read more of it I do have plans to read slam dunk one day one day <laughs> um although not in any immediacy but yeah this is a really really solid um solid title for those who do like action historical fiction drama um yeah i i don't really think i need to encourage people to read inoue's work because he is so well known and I do really love these releases. Some people complain about them because of the size and the heaviness and um, the potential for spine breakage. I've never personally had an issue with any of that. But then again, I don't take my books, especially not books of this size, out with me, like out and about. Um, I just generally don't take manga with me as it is. <laughs> the books that I take around with me tend to be library books and things of that nature. Um, so I personally haven't ever had an issue reading these, but I do know that that is a problem for some people. I don't think all of the singles are still in print, but I think 
you can still hunt them down uh, to a certain extent. So yeah, might be one for people who are interested in. So first on this top shelf we have the ever popular, ever wonderful shoujo manga Fruits Basket. This is a 23 volume series by Natsuki Takuya, but I own the 12 collector's edition re-releases from Yen Press. I believe in the US uh, it was originally released by Tokyo Pop. I personally had the Cheongyi or the Singaporean slash Australian releases for many many years, that's what I had in my collection, but um, the translation on those are not very good so I kind of jumped at the opportunity to replace them and this is a really wonderful new release. The translation's been updated and I think overall just a nicer put together set compared to the old Tokyo Pop singles. So uh, I think a lot of people are aware of the series now thanks to the newer uh, 2019 reboot of the anime, although this has always been a very popular and beloved kind of uh, 2000s shoujo back when people were a bit more accepting of this type of genre. I think it's one that appeals to most people if you give it a shot. This is the story of a high school girl called Toru Honda who is on the cover of this uh, first volume here. After the death of her mother she, after a se series of events, ends up camping out um, but she realizes that where she's been camping is actually the private property of one of her classmates and his family. And so again through another series of events she ends up living with her classmate Yuki Soma and his cousin, his older cousin. And then later, or quite subsequently um, later, they have an additional cousin of Yuki's join the household and that is Kyo Soma. So the three teenagers are sort of the main characters, Toru obviously and then Yuki and Kyo, and she quickly discovers that the Soma family, including Yuki and Kyo and the older cousin Shigeru, um, they all are under a particular curse wherein if they are hugged by, or I get, yeah, embraced by the opposite sex, they turn into a particular animal of the zodiac. So there's 13 of these cursed individuals, the 12 zodiac members plus the cat who is the animal who was for, or kind of tricked out of um, attending the, the banquet in the zodiac story. And so if you know the zodiac story, then the rat was the one who tricked the cat from attending and Yuki is the rat and Kyo is the cat. So the two have this long term ongoing rivalry. They kind of hate each other and are always trying to fight each other. And so Toru is kind of existing in the middle of this whole situation, um, but trying to bring all of these people together. Throughout the series, she meets the, the well, 10 other Zodiac members that she doesn't live with, uh, pretty much, and uh, learns more about their life, learns more about the curse and the responsibilities and the various cycles of abuse that each member has been subject to, trying to support them, trying to give them some hope for their life because the previous generations of Zodiacs, because this is a generational thing, every time uh, one member of the Zodiac dies, a new one is born. So every time that happens, um, the, it's always kind of not been a great situation. And also Toru and the Zodiacs' relationship to the head of the, the Soma family. It's a phenomenal series. I highly, highly, highly recommend it, especially if you like drama. Um, I think if you aren't super enraptured with the first volume-ish of, um, of the manga, then I think you give it a little bit of time because although I do think that it's fairly obvious that this is a darker story that does, um, I don't know if dark is quite the right word in how people regard it, but it does 
handle some very heavy themes about, as I mentioned, cycles of abuse and um, just very dark mentalities, self-hatred, jealousy, guilt, the, all those sorts of things, plus uh, some major unhealthy coping mechanisms from all of our characters. Uh, it is it is very, very good. It's a very powerful series, and I do think that it's one that most everyone, if not everyone, should read. You don't have to necessarily love it, but it... I, in my opinion, it stayed a classic and beloved by so many people um, for so long for good reason. I think that it's the story that really builds upon itself and it just continues to get better throughout the entirety of the series. And all of the various Zodiac characters and the non-Zodiac characters are really fascinating to read about. I mentioned in one of my earlier, the very first video, of um, my collection that I did for this, this series of videos. I talked about the follow-up or the sequel, which is Fruits Basket Another, which is a sort of a short spin-off of the next generation of the Soma family, pretty much. Um, and it's very, very good. That's not a necessity, and I do think a lot of people regard it as just fan service for the sake of fan service, um, which I don't inherently disagree with, but I think it's an interesting companion to this particular series. But of course, between the two, like this is the original, this is the one that is so powerful. And I think Takuya, at least in my experience of her works, um, this, is, this is the story of hers that you should read. Um, Twinkle Stars, I haven't read all of it, so I can't really comment. It is very good from what I have read, um, but a lot of the themes are very similar to what Fruits Basket handles, and because of the length of Fruits Basket, it is able to explore things in a larger way. So yeah, Fruits Basket, I don't think I need to really convince a lot of people to read this because it is so well known and beloved, but it is a very, very good series, and if you haven't tried it, do check it out, if not through the manga, then through the more recent anime adaptation. Next on the top shelf we have the only of Daisuke Igarashi's manga that we have in English, aside from a couple uh, one-shots here and there. Children of the Sea, a five-volume series about, a, I think she's in middle school, middle school girl who during one summer uh, she kind of hangs out with her dad at the aquarium where he works and she meets two mysterious young boys who are around her age who were found in the ocean as infants um, being raised by manatees or dugongs and because of that they have a very interesting connection to the ocean, to the water, to everything that lives within it and it also has had a physical effect on their bodies. They are very sensitive when they're outside of the water. Um, they have a hard time kind of breathing and um, the sun is very harsh on them. They have a lot, a lot of uh, dehydration problems, things like that. So it's kind of got a magical realist tone to it. I really like this particular series. I think Igarashi manages to capture the grand scale of the ocean and just the mystery and beauty and awe that really the ocean, in my opinion, should conjure up. We don't really know a huge amount about the oceans and the seas, despite the world being covered 70% by them. Uh, so it is, there's a grand mystery to this thing that we kind of just exist amongst and with. And these two boys are kind of the, a missing link between humanity and our existence on land and the more prehistoric kind of fundamental history of the world that exists within the ocean and all the majesty and magic that can come with that. It is phenomenal. I love it. It's one that I do hope more people read. I really like Igarashi's art style. I know it's not everyone's cup of tea, but again, when it comes to art style, I think it's very purposeful. His color pages in this are phenomenal. I adore them. And I did show off in an earlier video his art book, which was 
did contain a lot of work from this series and it is just absolutely phenomenal. Um, I also really like how this particular series, it has an overarching plotline and a, a plot that you follow with these three characters, these three preteens or early teen characters. But interspersed, we have kind of in single chapter inserted stories about other people's mysterious interactions with the ocean and the various things that that has impacted in their life. It's really, really good. It definitely plays into this idea of um, as humanity and as humans, we're drawn to the sea despite not being able to exist or, or survive within the ocean anymore um, because if you are uh, science focused uh, and believe in evolution all all life came from the sea it all came from these mysterious waters but now you know we've evolved past that and we can't really ever return to the oceans because we haven't adapted to them we don't we no longer have gills we no longer could just live happily within water and the water ecosystem so it's it's interesting on that regards and then the latter half of this series or the, the last third of it really plays into just the the connection between the cycle of birth and and death and rebirth and and the war and making very obvious parallels with like the ocean and the water of the womb and like all of these things oh it's really good i would classify this manga as like a literary manga it's one where you can unpack so many themes and it, every time you read it you gain something new i really also love the atmosphere of this particular series it really feels like you're captured in a summer you know in a, this summer moment and as someone's currently suffering through summer, like this is the perfect time of year for me to be reading it um, because it really does just capture the, the ups and the downs of the summer season and how, again, we're drawn to, to the ocean and how, it, it, how it's impacted our lives. It's, it is so good, <laughs> it is so good. There's also a lot of, um, going back to our connection with the water and the myth behind that the the sort of um indigenous beliefs of creation and how you know land and humans and that were were formed from the ocean or for like if you know i don't know how many people um know this but like the a lot of the Pacific Islanders, a lot of like New Zealand and that, so much of their myth is, because they're islands obviously, is focused around the ocean and a lot of that goes into this particular series and it's really lovely to see that kind of incorporated into a manga of this nature. Phenomenal series, highly recommended at five volumes, it's not super duper long and you can see just from here, they're not omnibuses or anything but they are thick. You get a lot of, uh, you get a lot of content for your dollar with Children of the Seas. They are great, great, great investments. And as I said, if you like a story where you can dive into it, uh, excuse the pun, and just unpack so many things about it and gain so much with each and every, you know, uh, experience with it and reread, um, then Children of the Sea is absolutely for you. As well, I must mention that this recently got a film adaptation, an anime film adaptation I watched early in the, in the year. It's currently in cinemas in Australia. Um, it might be today or tomorrow might be the last day that it's in cinemas, but I implore you to check it out. I know that uh, cinema screenings may have also already happened in the US. I can't remember, but um, I, I saw it a lot earlier than I think a lot of places. It was playing at a couple film festivals in Australia much earlier in the year, about halfway through the year, which is where I watched it. 
and it was just really a perfect adaptation. It captured so much of what I loved about this manga. It is beautiful, the animation style is incredible, the music is wonderful, and uh, it's just an absolute experience. What Seeing it in the cinema is just, again, you, you're captured by that awe, that grandness, that mystery. And uh, so, yeah, I cannot recommend both the manga or the film enough. Finally, for this top shelf, we have Inyo Asano's Solonin, uh, the complete uh, omnibus of the original series, and then also the short 40-ish pages um, so epilogue, which was a TCAF, uh, TCAF, yeah, exclusive. Um, so what the, this is a manga that I think a lot of people know up until very recently this is the go-to for me and a lot of people um, for Arsenault's works as a recommendation. I think this, like with uh, Da 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 Destruction, is probably his most approachable of series and uh, the, the epilogue has, is just a recent addition and when I heard about it and heard that they were selling it then I had to grab it. But this is a story of a group of young adults um, kind of just out of college trying to figure their way through life looking for work, um, most notably focused on a particular couple and their hopes and also dissatisfaction with their lives, their expectations on what their life should have been or what they think their life should have been and where it actually is. I won't say it's a overwhelmingly hopeful story, but I wouldn't say it's an overwhelmingly negative or, or um, upset type of story either. I think it's just an interesting in look into what I believe is very common emotions of young people who are at this point in their life, which is why I do think that this is a fairly easy one to recommend to most people because it is very, very relatable. Um, it's also really good to recommend because it is a shorter one. It's complete in the, just the single volume. This epilogue isn't a necessity, but it is set 10 years later and it does give some additional, I guess, hope for these characters and for where their lives have turned out. It's really wonderful. Really, really, really good. Um, as I said, with Arsenault's work, I think you have to be in a particular mindset or mood for a lot of them, which is why I find it very hard to recommend a majority of his most beloved works, most notably Goodnight Pun Pun. But Solonen is very, very popular and it is deserving of that popularity, I believe, because it really does, like, again, like all of his work, capture kind of the dissatisfaction of youth and, and not like youth youth, but like young person youth and that stress and kind of hopelessness of feeling like you're becoming everything that you didn't want to become. Um, and how you can change that for yourself, how the decisions you make impact your life and the people around you, which is why I think it's a it's kind of a double-edged sword when recommending Solonin because I do think a lot of people love it, a lot of people relate to it, it is kind of approachable compared to his other works, but then they fall in love with this one and then jump straight into some of his other works and then they go oh my god no uh, ew god I'm I am was not prepared for this and I'm not enjoying this um, most notably with a girl on the shore which I do not recommend to anyone unless you know exactly what you're getting into because that can be an uncomfortable book and I it's not that I don't think that it should exist or that it shouldn't be licensed or anything because I do I'm very happy that it has been licensed but be very aware if you're if you're wanting to read Asano be very aware of what a girl on the shore or yeah a girl on the shore is about and what it depicts 
and what it is 97% made up of because it's it's a very uncomfortable series purposefully um, but I don't think a lot of people are understandably comfortable with it so again just be aware of that um, but Solonen, wonderful, very, very good, and really happy that we did see um, the epilogue in print. Um, even though it was kind of an event exclusive one, you can still buy it on the um, kind of, is it pages and panels? I think is the TCAF um, store, a web, web store. I think so. I don't know. You have to look it up. But it is still available. It's pretty cheap. Uh, well, it, like it's relatively cheap compare, considering it's a proper Viz release um, and it is an event exclusive thing. So if you are already a fan of Solonen but you do not own the epilogue, then maybe uh, invest in the follow-up and continue your enjoyment. Next Shelf starts with a Kaoramori book as expected. This is anything and something, or Kaoramori, anything and something. This is a collection of one-shots um, hardcover release from Yen Press. Really beautiful book. Um, it really, really self-indulgent on Mori's part as well. You've got lots of maids, you've got lots of very sexy ladies, and these are all just various short one-chapter stories that were published in various publications throughout her career. Um, it's a bit of an older book now, and I think it's very out of print, unfortunately. But I do recommend it if you're a Mori fan, although it may take you a while to find a decently priced copy. Um, yeah, it, as I said, it is very self-indulgent. You can see here we've got a maid, we've also got a school uniform uh, girl, and that particular story is pretty interesting insofar as your perception of yourself when wearing a uniform versus, you know, your more regular clothes. And then we've got you know a very sexy bunny girl here and if nothing else Maury can draw a beautiful female figure <laughs> so if that is your interest then I recommend her work just in general um, but there's a lot of really interesting little snippets of ideas here and it's a pretty decent collection of short stories as expected from one of my favorite mangaka and when I was starting to buy her works this was uh, one of the first ones that I did because it's a single volume. It kind of showcases some of her best stuff insofar as what she likes to draw and what she likes to write about. And if, again, I can't really readily um, recommend it because it is out of print, but if you haven't read any of Maury's work, then I do think this would give you a good indication of what her series are like and how her writing style is and how her characters kind of feel and interact with the world around them. It is very good and I love it. Next is Maury's completed work, uh, Emma, or the anime adaptation is Emma, a Victorian Romance. Um, volumes one to five in the Yen Press hardcover re-releases, uh, collecting 10 single volumes, so two in one omnibuses. I love this series a lot. Um, I will say that I think A Bride Story, which I showed off in one of the earlier videos, is in my opinion her best work, but I do think that if you are a fan of her stories and if you haven't given Emma a shot, absolutely do. The anime adaptation is wonderful as well, just by the way. But this is the story of a young woman who is a maid, her name is Emma, uh, set in Victorian England and she's kind of the singular personal maid to a woman who previously was a governess um, but now she is much older she just doesn't really have much to do in her life but she needs to you know uphold her household so she actually took in Emma as a orphan um, and trained her up to be a a maid gave her some skills, taught her how to read and write, um, helped got her glasses, so helped fix her eyesight, all, all sorts of things. So she kind of became a surrogate daughter to this woman. Um, and I mean, anyway, so at the beginning of our series, um, Emma, well, one of the governess's previous 
students um, who she used to teach um, and he, he and his, I guess, siblings for a period comes to visit her. And when he does, he meets Emma and just absolutely falls head over heels in love with her. And it's a fairly uh, quickly reciprocated feeling. And Emma's quite popular. She has a lot of uh, young men interested in her, but William <laughs> definitely has caught her eye. But there is, of course, a huge conflict with the social class issue. Um, William and his family aren't particularly like they're not royalty they're not necessarily the gentry but so they're kind of even within society seen as you know not worthy of participating in society they're merchants or you know come up and coming money new money as it were um so the family as a whole and their businesses and their place in society is being scrutinized by you know the old money um, which makes William's father very hyper aware of everything that his children are doing and everything that the family is portraying itself to be. And so he is very strict about them following the social rules as expected of those of the upper class, right? So um, although William doesn't have an issue with being in love with Emma and he doesn't care about the, their class difference and you know if if possible he you know jump straight away into marrying her and doing whatever he want but but as the oldest son he has a responsibility for, to the family um, in you know taking over the business once his father decides to retire or dies um, so he doesn't have the freedom that he wishes in order to pursue the love of his life pretty much so there's a lot of conflict as to you know social differences and the various issues of society and high society within this victorian setting maury i've said before with her other work a bride story puts in so much research for her series all of her notes everything that if you read her author notes and stuff after the book is just so intensely researched and drawn and just so she has such a love for this particular setting and she is a huge maid otaku like oh my goodness you know if you've watched or read the series um miss kobayashi's dragon maid that's kind of the level that Mori is on. She adores maids and everything that maids are. Um, so, and so she's very indulgent, especially in this series and one of her earlier works that we'll get to in a minute, um, in just lovingly portraying these women who would work very thankless jobs throughout history. Their uniform, their duties, their everything, everything in their life. Um, really great uh, kind of um, exploration of the setting as well. You can tell that she didn't just watch a couple, you know, period dramas or something um, for research. She actually went in, saw what was there, saw how society functioned. There's a really, um, I really like the chapter in this series about the library and kind of how libraries were sort of just beginning to be a thing and because of the printing press meant that books could be much more widely read and bought for personal collections as well like oh there's so much interesting stuff here um hyde park makes a very notable uh, debut or <laughs> cameo within this series and i really love um the our William's friend, his his Indian prince friend, who is just a great addition to the cast. And okay, volume five. All of these books as well have um, reversible covers, so you get do have all of the covers for each ten of the volumes. But volume five, I keep. I really love this particular cover because it has my favorite characters on there. I mean, I love all of the characters, don't get me wrong. Um, but I do really love the Germans, who are a family that Emma later goes on to work for. 
I just love them and their relationship and oh my goodness they're so good they're wonderful um I, obviously again I said sort of societal difference clashing um, is one of the huge elements of the drama here we also have um, like efforts to find William a more appropriate match and more appropriate bride things like that so if if period drama romance is your thing then absolutely read Emma and even if it's not your thing but you are a fan of Maury absolutely read Emma um, and if you're just kind of a fan of of historical historically accurate fiction then read Emma it's <laughs> it checks all the boxes Next we have Go Go Monster by Tayo Matsumoto. This is a single volume release hardcover with a cardboard slipcase as well. It's kind of an interesting release um, to mimic the Japanese release. This is the story of two elementary school boys, one who's kind of um, just, you know, a normal kid and then one of his classmates who's definitely a little bit odd. He kind of interacts with the world that no one else can see. Um, he, he's not really accepted by his peers and as such our main character is kind of his only tie to the rest of the world if that makes sense. Uh, so Gogo -Go Monster is a really interesting story about friendship and creativity and imagination and also your place as a kid and growing up and deciding what's real and deciding how you want to live your life and the, that kind of the the hopeful part and kind of the creative energy that kids have and also trying to dismantle it, the idea of forced conformity especially within children um, which is kind of a big issue I would say in uh, amongst I, all kids, but I think definitely Japanese kids, there's a, and teenagers and everyone, to kind of fit a specific mold and if you don't then you're definitely seen as weird. And as I said, this is not a unique thing to Japan, I think everyone, <laughs> especially those who have been regarded as the weird kid can kind of understand that. But there's so much artistry to how Matsumoto encaptures this story. I really, I've, I've said it before, um, I showed off some of Matsumoto's other works already, but he just has such a gift in portraying these types of characters, these types of situations, and it's always done with such, such empathy, such love, such understanding for those of us who don't necessarily regard ourselves as being normal, right? Gogo -Go Monster is probably one of his works that not a lot of people know about, which is a shame because it really is worth the read. It might be a little bit harder for some people to connect to because it does entirely focus on like young kids, elementary school kids, but I don't think that Honestly, I don't think that makes it that hard to relate to it or understand the story. In fact, it's a quite uh, straightforward message, in my opinion. But if you have read Matsumoto's works, whether that be Sunny, whether that be Tech on Kingcrete, whether that be um, Ping Pong and the upcoming release of the manga for that, if you've seen the show for that, um, give Gogo -Go Monster a try. It is so worth the time. And Matsumoto, as I said, is incredibly good at what he does. I, I think there's really no one else who manages to capture the certain emotions that kids go through at certain periods in their life as well as he does. The kind of innocent straightforwardness uh, of kids who don't really understand the various shades of grey that exist just naturally within life, but also kind of the, the hyper awareness and the much larger awareness that kids have to their surroundings, to situations that I think a lot of adults forget 
kids have. Uh, it's it's really really good, really wonderful. Um, and if you if it sounds like your thing, I would encourage you to pick it up. It's a really nice release as well from Viz. Next is Utsubora, the story of a novelist. This is by Asumiku Nakamura, and this was the only of Nakamura's work we had in English for a criminally long time. Um, I, I adore Nakamura's works. I love her art style. I think it's just so beautiful, so sensual, so just, it, oh, oh, it's so good. This is a story about a novelist who has been accused of plagiarism and his uh, ultimately tragic and fatal attraction to a young woman um, whom is the one who is said that he, he plagiarized from and the very twisted mindset between him and this woman, much younger woman, and there's a mystery element to it, there's definitely a how do I phrase this? A uh, patheticness to these characters, but a relatable patheticness. And they don't, they aren't necessarily good people, they aren't making good choices, and they're not really characters you want to root for, but it's so intriguing to follow their story and to see how things will turn out. And there is definitely a mystery element to this one. Um, I think it will surprise you in the certain directions that it goes. Um, yeah, just absolutely phenomenal. Really happy that we've, we have had this one and I can recommend it for a lot of people. It is kind of dark, a little bit of a thriller, mystery, um, and uh, obviously does, um, because of just how Nakamura's work, Nakamura's work works, it, it just oozes this atmosphere and it, it really captures kind of the the muddled morality of these characters and their relationship to each other and how they interact with each other. Phenomenal series, phenomenal series. Um, as I said, I am really happy that we've gotten more of Utsu, uh, of Nakamura's work in the more recent years, but it ha has been wonderful to own this one for so long as well. This is a vertical release, definitely falls in line with their typical series that they uh, they put out. I think this is a seinen. I can't quite remember. Maybe a jose. Um, but regardless, it's a must read, I think, for anyone who likes darker dramatic stories. If you like stories, um, darker stories about writing and the idea of um, I like original ideas and plagiarism and that sort of thing. If you like sordid affairs, then this this is the book for you. Um, and it's it's just overwhelmingly wonderful. Um, the main premise, as I said, is about this this author who kind of forgets or loses inspiration, plagiarizes from. A woman, young woman who is very interested in him and they, they have a very intense uh, relationship but she ends up dying and so the, his, like the, the reality of his plagiarism, the truth of his plagiarism or plagiarizing her work doesn't get out until another woman um, emerges who is her identical twin and so he feels like he's being followed by a ghost. It's very intense, very interesting, very, very atmospheric. Um, yeah, give it a shot, give it a try. Changing gears a little bit with My Brother's Husband by Gengoro Tagame. This is a Pantheon Books uh, print release. Um, and for a lot of people, I think this is probably their first, um, first experience with Tagame's work, which would make sense because this is a very sweet, very lovely um, story about a, a Japanese man and his, his young daughter who after the death of his twin brother, um, his brother's husband, who is a, a obviously gay Canadian man, comes to visit him and, and his daughter in order to meet the family of his, of his 
now deceased husband because they never had the chance to go to Japan together. He, his, the brother never had the chance to introduce his family to, to his other part of his family, his partner, the person he loves. And so this is a really beautifully done, nuanced look at family and obviously prejudice, even if it's not uh, an aware prejudice of queer people, gay people within Japan. Um, very obviously there's, there's a different culture in Japan surrounding um, the acceptance of the LGBT community versus the Western world. Um, it, things are getting better, but I don't know if it'll ever quite make it to where other places are, but that's not to say that there's a lot of issues and a lot more things that do need to keep happening. Um, but obviously, like in Japan, gay marriage is not legal. Um, in a lot of places in the world, gay marriage hasn't been legal for very long, including Australia. Um, but our main character, his his brother, his twin brother, identical twin brother, um, after coming out as gay, af they when they were younger, they were very very close. But after his brother came out as gay, although he never like belittled him for it or never like physically said anything negative he never said like hated him for that um, he also wasn't wholly loving and accepting and understanding of that either and so they drifted apart throughout adulthood so this is a really like it's not only is it an educational manga insofar as it uses the daughter uh, Kana I think her, her name is um, as a way to ask questions that kids do because kids are very uh, curious beings um, about gay people and things that maybe the general reader within Japan just isn't aware of and also the western perspective of gayness um, to Mike, her, her uncle, um, and being taught various things about gay people that that she otherwise wouldn't know. And in through through her, it's also teaching the audience about these things. And it's really nice, it's a really lovely way of showing how our main character, his perception starts to change too. And he starts to challenge his own preconceived notions and prejudices of gay people that he did, wasn't even aware that he had. Um, and also, brings in the idea of like family and brings in his relationship with his ex-wife and then all, you know their kid together and things like that and of course the grief of losing a, a partner and not being able to experience the things that you deem so important with the person you love the most in your life um, because of their untimely death and the grief of losing a sibling who you never fully were able to reconnect with and and apologize to it's really 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 good um, but I it is probably the easiest of Tagame's work to um, recommend because majority of his stuff is hardcore gay komi um, <laughs> hardcore um, very very explicit gay manga written by gay men for gay men um it's it's not <laughs> it's not the sweet you know fluffy bl stuff that um, a lot of people think of when they think gay comics it's not boys love it is gay comi and that can get pretty intense very kinky and it's a bit like i think for some people it might be a bit confronting if you're not used to it um also like you may notice on the covers here, big beefy men, uh, again, very different from the kind of very pretty boy waifs of, of BL. Uh, so yeah, Tagame's work, we do have some of his, his gay komi available in English, uh, quite a bit of it, in fact, but it's not one that I would be like, yeah, absolutely, go read that because I don't know your, like, you might not like it. And it's 
not something I think also it's kind of hard to find I don't know if it's in print still but Tagame is definitely very well known he's probably the most most notable gay komi artist um and at least in his reputation outside of Japan like he's very very big and well known in Europe and in in the US if you are following that circle um so yeah it's really nice to have um him do a manga that is a bit more approachable for everyone and his current series I think is a similar idea a little bit easier to recommend like my brother's husband um so I hope we see that sometime in the future but this is a four volume series collected into two two and one only by and it's it's really really good there is also uh paperback editions available now as well um there's a couple different releases for this this is the first hardcover release with the slip cover um so yeah jump on it if you haven't it is so 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 worth the read finally for manga on the shelf we have the singular volume of Shirley that CMX released before their untimely demise. This is the first of Karamori's work ever. Um, it was completed in two volumes, I believe, but just re it might have been completed in just this one volume, but just recently, over the last couple years, uh, she's returned to it and has been working on the sequel kind of immediate follow up to this series. It's kind of the continuation um and i think it goes by shirley madison it might just be like shirley you know volume two three four whatever um yeah you can definitely tell this is an early work uh, it's not nearly as polished as stuff like emma or a bride story but that's understandable but again very very self-indulgent with the maid thing and this is kind of just the day-to-day -day life of a young maiden training. Uh, well, she's a maid, but she's she's still kind of uh, establishing herself and learning the ropes called Shirley. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a pretty fun, lighthearted, slice of life story about maids and what they do and, you know, their role and purpose and Shirley's interaction with the people in her life, the other maids, the you know footmen, butlers, things like that. Uh, again, just completely self-indulgent <laughs> for Maury and her love of Victorian England and maids and sort of the uh, servant class, I guess, of this period of time. It's it's very good, um, and I do hope that maybe one day Yen Press might. Uh, rescue license it and we might get a nice fancy hardcover release uh, like all of the other <laughs> Mori Yen Press releases. That'd be cool. That'd be great. I'd buy that. Uh, just a suggestion there, Yen, but you know, I wouldn't go astray. Finally for the shelf we have my 1 8th scale of Emma from Emma. Uh, so this is a pretty interesting, old, hard to find scale figure. I was very lucky in hunting her down for a relatively good price and she's just beautiful. Um, it's not all the time that we get manga characters as figures and I would say that this probably came out the same time that the anime adaptation came out so that's probably why. Um, but she's interesting. You may notice um, down here she's not on her base. She comes with like a large uh, red kind of faux velvet disc base uh, which is very tall which is why I don't have her on there because she wouldn't fit on the shelf otherwise um, but her her stance her poles where she's her weight is kind of being held by those little plastic poles um, from her dress manages to keep her pretty stable um, she doesn't fall over or anything like that she also comes with two pairs of spectacles or eyeglasses um, which, so they're actually removable. They're very, very fine, um, metal. Beautiful release. Really happy to have her. Um, and yeah, I mean, uh, it's, it's, 
she's the kind of character that nowadays I don't think would necessarily get a character and even when she came out she wasn't really the type of character she just isn't from the type of show or manga that a lot of people buy char like characters and merchandise and figures for so it is kind of a rare treat that we do have her um, but also like again looking at the polls and and her not being on her base she's she is completely held up by those um, sticks. I don't think she has pegs on her base. She might. It's been a long time since I've seen it, but she's solid. <laughs> Definitely solid. And if you're, again, I can't really recommend this particular figure because it is very hard to find. It's very old uh, at this point, over 10 years old now. Um, so it's not one you can just kind of find easily in the wild. But if you love the series, and you want to hunt it down, then, uh, you know, maybe put some alerts on at your favorite secondhand uh, Japanese store, and you, you might get lucky. You might get lucky. You might be paying $400 for her, but you might get lucky. On the next shelf, we start with a series that is very near and dear to my heart, Princess Jellyfish by Akiko Higashimura. This is a series that I bought as it was coming out. And then I also bought the box set, <laughs> so my original single uh, volumes I gifted to my sister because she loves the series as well, but did not own her own set of the manga. So this is a 17 volume series collected in eight two-in-one or nine volumes that are kind of omnibuses. They're not quite two-in-ones, I don't think. I don't know. I th they might be. Nine has a bunch of extra stuff on there, so it's a little bit thicker than a regular a single volume but this uh, I spoke about when I talked about the anime but this is the story of Tsukimi who is a 18 year old uh, illustrator who's moved to Tokyo to kind of follow her dreams I guess of being an illustrator but she is particularly enamored with jellyfish she's a huge jellyfish otaku and basically all of her illustrations um, are about jellyfish and most of her time is spent on jellyfish she and she's kind of like she's definitely a neat she doesn't really have any permanent employment and she re really regards herself as outside of the sphere of normal people quote unquote um kind of more the popular people um the popular young crowd of who who most 18 year olds try to be like she she really doesn't see herself as that and she lives with a bunch of women uh all of whom are quite a bit older than her but who are ostensibly neats and otaku in their own right now we have sort of the landlady of their boarding house or the daughter of the landlady i should say the one who actually runs the place and she loves traditional clothing and she loves dolls and uh, think everything to do with like traditional kimono we have another character who is so into uh, romance of the three kingdoms or whatever that is like that she's really into that um, we have a train otaku who just adores the railroad and all the various different types of trains and uh, we have a, <laughs> a uh, Gigi who is a kind of like an old man otaku she really loves the older gentleman um, and goes to kind of like butler cafes where all of the waiters are older men and just kind of basks in the beauty of of the mature specimen as it were uh, and they also have a pretty reclusive BL mangaka who never shows their face and is also kind of like the, the rule maker of this boarding house because under their dec decree, there is no men allowed to live in this boarding house, which suits them because all of these women don't really have an interest in love and, and living a normal life that um, distracts them from their hobbies. Uh, but one day, Tsukimi runs into, uh, well, she's trying to just look at one of her favorite aquariums. They have a particular um, jellyfish there, but she realizes that that jellyfish is being housed with a jellyfish 
that it shouldn't be housed with it, they're poisonous to each other um, and so she wants to save this this jellyfish that she cares so much about but she doesn't have the confidence to speak to the clerk uh, because he is very trendy and kind of brash and thinks she's a bit of a weirdo so he's not going to listen to her but the day is saved when a mysterious beautiful princess of a girl um, comes and basically is like no I'll help you uh, we want to buy that jellyfish what do we need I'll buy the tank and I'll we'll pay for it and I'll help you bring it home so she does that um, and then when they get home she doesn't really know how to thank this mysterious girl but she's also conflicted because she's let a popular girl into their sanctuary as it were and um, before she can kind of force her to leave or get her to leave this this other girl crashes out on the floor she's like oh man I've been partying the last three days I'm so tired I'm just gonna sleep here is that okay and she, and so she doesn't really get the opportunity to kick this girl out so she kind of falls asleep after panicking a bit when she wakes up she awakes amidst a, a cloud of hair and realizes that this girl was wearing a wig and she's like well that's probably what trendy people do but very shortly she discovers that this this beautiful princess of a girl was not a girl at all um, was, but was a very handsome young man who enjoys wearing women's clothes um, and it's a really interesting and odd and wonderful friendship between the two of them and their shared kind of parallel passions because our our char main character uh, Sukumi has loves loves jellyfish and she's a very talented artist and then Kuronosuke our main male character he is very into women's fashion and clothing and being able to wear whatever he wants it's not really um, I've said it before Okay, now that the water bombers have passed over us, um, apologies for the noise. It's summer in Australia and there's bushfires everywhere. So, yeah, get us, that's how my life is right now. But I've said this before in regard to this manga. This isn't, um, for Kuronosuke, the wearing of women's clothing isn't so much a gender thing or to do with his personal identity. It's more so just his interest in clothes and the fact that female fashion as a general rule is just a bit more creative it has more freedom and so he's able to express himself um, more openly and happily and, and he really able to embrace every part of himself um, and plus he really enjoys doing dressing up as a girl in particular because it pisses off his dad who is a politician his uncle is also the prime minister um, so they have very strict beliefs in like how he should be acting. He's the illegitimate son of this minister. He has a half brother who is kind of the the perfect <laughs> the perfect politician, just uptight, straight laced, who quickly uh, later on kind of falls in love with Sukimi as well. Um, so there's a lot of moving parts, but. I really, really love this particular series because I think it captures passions, regardless of where they're focused, just the the passions of people and being able to embrace that and also be able to utilize that to create something more. I also really like the depiction of the fashion industry, the realism of the fashion industry in this particular series. Um, I've said it not in these videos, but I say it, I've said it when the, the singles were coming out for the series and whenever I talk about the series, but my parents were actually in the fashion industry. That's how they met. They both owned, um, well, my dad owned stores and like boutiques and stuff. And then my mum owned her own fashion label. Um, and when they got together, they established their own label. So like, a lo and when I was born, they had that label. So fashion was a huge part of their life and their life together and early on in their relationship so from my understanding of what they've told me because 
my parents are like they did tell us everything so I've grown up with like a lot of stories of the fashion industry and the people in the fashion industry and the various kind of rules and perceptions that that fashion um, has um, so it's been interesting it, for this it's really nice to see a lot of what I've been told and what I've been uh, taught throughout my life being reflected as reality and as truth in this manga and that's not to say that I didn't believe my parents but it's more to say that usually fashion in media especially in manga and anime is kind of seen as a fun kind of easy industry when in reality it's not <laughs> like it is a super high paced high like um, intensity industry that is constantly changing you have to constantly be working there's a bunch of deadlines there's a particular part in this manga where a very high um, like hook couture um, line doesn't sell super well so the CEO rather than selling the items for a reduced price during sale season instructs the company to just burn everything um, which is something that that fashion labels do for not like for the stuff that you get at like a Walmart or whatever but for fashion line like labels things like the Dolce & Gabbana's of the world or the Versace's of the world excess stock doesn't get sold later down the line at reduced prices because that would ultimately reduce the overall value of those pieces if if you can sell like if you're if you're selling a shirt for ten thousand dollars or whatever and then people know that they can buy that for half price or you know 70 percent off down the line then nobody's going to buy your stuff new um so it is that like ugh, it's a really um, interesting way like I'm so happy that that was in there and I think that's something that people aren't super duper aware of that is just kind of common common practice within when you're at that level within the industry that's not something my parents ever did because they weren't high fashion <laughs> but it is something that does happen all of the time all of the time um, another thing I really really liked about this this series and in particular that kind of that same character that CEO character and his personal arc was um, he was an orphan in Singapore that's kind of his backstory and what he learned during his time in the orphanage and being a kid who was kind of skipped over um, being adopted a couple times was that presentation and the first impression is like what matters the most um, if you can present yourself it doesn't have to be anything super duper fancy but if you give yourself a clean and polished look whether that's a white button down shirt whether that's the you know the quintessential uh, little black dress um, if you just have are put together and you look like you know what you're doing or you you know that you deserve to be here that makes all of the difference and again that's something that I have always been taught and even when I have zero clue about what I'm doing if you can dress well you it makes other people believe that you know what you're doing and it makes people um, subconsciously more likely to attach themselves to you or hire you or whatever um, so yeah again really nice to see that paralleled and I guess echoed in this particular manga I also really love the ending of this manga it's kind of open-ended but I think that's the perfect way that this story could have done it and I cried <laughs> a lot when it was over <coughs> this this series is just so kind and genuine and wonderful to its characters it fully embraces them for all of their weirdness and their nerdiness and their unusual hobbies and their unusual pastimes and their fear of of sticking out and being you know part of or, or their kind of criticisms of their self and their rejection of popularity and society's um, I guess rewarding popularity and rewarding and embracing a particular type of person and personality and um, habits 
as better than other like it's so good it's so good i also really love kuranosuke's personal journey throughout this series i love um the, all of the side characters as well i think the prime minister and and his brother the minister are so is this his brother or is his brother-in-law it doesn't really matter are really funny like <laughs> they're for as stuffy and like um you know uptight as they are in their professional lives as as you know politi politicians um they're not inherently good or bad people um they're definitely politicians <laughs> they're definitely politicians um but they're they're just a joy to read as well they're all every character is so funny and wonderful and fun and i think relatable even if you're not you know a jellyfish otaku i think there's something to be gained in reading about these characters and it's really nice to see them working hard towards something even if they don't realize or don't understand why they should be working hard towards something it, it's really good. It's really, 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 really good. And this box set is really lovely. It doesn't come with anything super duper special. You get a Clara or the, a jellyfish keychain. You get a poster that says, um, no men or like, yeah, something along those lines, um, which is the decree of, of the, the, Amir's the the boarding boarding house and of course you get like the actual box set which is really lovely so you know it's uh it's well worth the investment and I highly recommend it next we have descending stories volumes 1 to 10 the complete series by Haruko Kumota this is uh, also known as Showa Genroku Rakugo Shinju it has a two season anime adaptation and I highly encourage you all to read to watch it right now it's on crunchyroll it is one of the best if not the best character dramas of the decade um perhaps of all time it is phenomenal and i adore it this manga is the story of a rakugo uh, um, performer who if you're not familiar with what that is they are a traditional storyteller and it follows his life from childhood to up until old age and, and ultimately his death um, and his struggles in life in being a member and later uh, sort of the the master or the the f the last true master of this particular traditional art that is not very popular and throughout the show a period which I mentioned in one of the earlier videos, ran from 1926 to 1989, so a huge period of time, um, was really a dying art. It was something that people weren't interested in. It kind of was emblematic of previous eras, and so through the modernization of Japan, it felt like ultimately so too Rakugo would disappear and our main character with with that would lose his purpose in life. Um, Descending Stories is very much like the title itself um, talk like includes the words double suicide and it is about this character, his perception of when he dies, he's committing d double suicide with Rakugo because when he dies, so too ends the life of this art form no one else would care about it versus like compared to him which we as the audience know is not the case and like Rakugo still exists uh, I talked about I talk about the series a lot um, but I did talk about it a lot with um, Ray from Whimsical Pictures in our very first podcast episode this was one of my top five series uh, favorites ever um, this is so 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 beautiful and I think there's something to be said about how this story portrays the struggles of an artist and the struggles of an of an art form that is losing people's interest it's losing its audience um, 
the very self-centered nature of artists sometimes and how they perceive themselves as being emblematic to an era. Uh, it's And of course, of course, the Showa period being a huge period of change in Japan, how much the country itself morphed and evolved over the 70, you know, 60 years of of the Showa period. So much happened, not just in Japan, just generally. I mean, th in the Showa period, we had the Second World War. We had, you know, we sent a man to the moon. We, you know, um, people got televisions. Disco happened. Um, you know, all of pops happened. Like so much change, entertainment changed, which is why there is so much struggle and so much uh, cynicism and so much negativity with our main character um, on how Rakugo would survive when the people of the current age of the modern day for him or the present day no longer sees the value in these stories that have existed for thousands of years um, they're not they don't apply to or they don't feel like they apply to young people of today and thus they don't capture the interest of young people today it's an incredibly beautifully done and nuanced look at not only his complicated relationship to an art form that initially he wasn't even that invested or interested in um, and how he gained freedom and independence through uh, Rakugo and his his personal relationships and connections he made through Rakugo. It is phenomenally done that there's huge elements and themes of guilt and survivor's guilt especially um, and being haunted and being punished by the people of your past and the, for him there's a huge element of he's very de he's he feels he's very deserving of all of the ire and all of the bad luck and everything that's gone wrong in his life because of choices he's he made in the past and because of how he's lived his life thus far it's just so beautiful to see and again as an audience member we know that his perception of himself, of the art form, and the people around him is very self-centered, very skewed, and very negative. Um, he really doesn't see much positivity in his own existence. And it's only through the side characters that we really gain a true sense of the situation. Um, so the main premise uh, of this story, uh, the major, I guess, plot of this story is not just a look at this this main character's life um, and his his relationship with Rakugo, but later in life he takes on an apprentice, the only apprentice he's ever taken on, because again he doesn't he doesn't want to continue Rakugo. He doesn't want it to keep going, but he kind of gets worn down by a a young man who, after hearing a Rakugo performance by our main character in prison, whilst he was in prison, uh, was inspired to become a Rakugo performer himself. And so it's about him learning Rakugo and then learning more about his master and learning more about the complicated relationships his master had with other people in Rakugo and um, his adopted daughter and well kind of adopted daughter and all of these things like there's so many things and it it works so seamlessly and it's so beautiful and again it's one that I think really transcends the medium it's it's a story that I think hasn't been captured with such perfection um, in a long time, if not ever. It's one that is incomparable. And the anime adaptation especially, the Rakugo performances are 
phenomenal. Um, Dean, Studio Dean, which is not a studio that's generally well known for its animation quality, did a phenomenal job on this series. It is so beautiful, um, the anime. And yeah, I, it's criminal that we do not have the anime on disc yet. I want someone to license it. Please, 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 please. You got my hopes up in the UK, um, but then that ultimately never happened. And then, so I'm waiting, I'm waiting, I'm waiting, I'm waiting. Please, somebody license this series. Um, the anime because the manga is complete and I really this was the first I mean I I like a lot of Kodansha series and Princess Jellyfish was coming out uh, quite a few of their series were coming out that I really love you have seen in the collection but this series their licensing of this series kind of was emblematic to me in showing that they they really were putting out things that would not have ever, ever, ever been licensed prior to this point in time, prior to the market in its current state. I don't think the anime was particularly well known. It is hugely popular for the people who have seen it, but it's not one that, you know, is, it's not like a Sword Art Online or like an Attack on Titan. It's not hugely popular. So I, I just assumed we'd never get the manga. And Kodansha proved me wrong, and I am so happy that they did. And it really was this point, when this manga was licensed, that I felt like the market had changed so much from what it used to be, and in a really positive way, in a way that I don't think it ever would have been able to achieve before the bubble burst in, like the anime uh, kind of um, community or initially just right after it. I, I think there's so much to be said that this series got a complete release and it's just done so wonderfully. Now all I need is the anime, please guys. Uh, but it is, it is incredible. I've talked far too long about it, but it's one that if you like very intimate character introspective pieces then in stories then you need to be reading this um uh, the other thing and i've said it before when i talked about the series but one of the other really major elements is the preservation of traditional art forms which so often do get lost through the change and shift of society and the shift of interest from the younger generations. There's so much in history that we've lost, whether it be from indigenous languages and art forms to just kind of historical pastimes that were deemed as like old and not interesting anymore, that you lose so much of history. And for Rakugo, which is the art of storytelling, um, obviously the verbalization of, of myth and legend and, and entertainment. Telling stories has been a part of human culture ever since we could make noises, right? Like, the, it's such a fundamental part of human existence. And before we had, you know, the internet and television and hell, even radio, um, storytelling was how we passed on our morals, our lessons, our history as, as homo sapiens to each other. And there's, for Rakugo, which the, in the series it says like these are traditional stories there a lot of them are hundreds if not a thousand years old and if you lose that if you lose the fact that people are telling those stories you lose the perspective and you lose the morals and the lessons that people were teaching each other at that period you're losing so much of human history if you lose the storytellers um I mean, I'm particularly passionate about this because um, for any of those of you who don't know, I am 
a writing, no longer a student, I am a writer, a professional writer, not so much a fiction, like a um, creative writer, but writing and, and speaking is so important to just human history that it's, it's, we lose so much when we lose not only stories but when we lose languages um for example um indigenous australians so aboriginal people pre pre colonization um there's believed to have been 50,000 different languages within australia just because each tribe had a different language now we have maybe eight that are somewhat being preserved. Um, it may be a little bit higher, maybe a little bit lower, but I mean, really, out of 50,000, even if we have a hundred that we know of and we kind of are aware of and may be in general use, um, that's, we've lost so much, so much of the the knowledge of this country because of you know just not no interest in preserving the indigenous the indigenous languages and the indigenous stories um which you know comes with the colonization of any country i'm sure there's a lot the same thing happens in every every culture every country especially those who <laughs> have been colonized um so it's it's really a sad thing and an important thing that we need to value more than we do so. Um, and so by knowing the stories of the people who have come before us, of people from a thousand years before us, we learn about who they are, what they were doing, why they were doing these things. And also we recognize that really despite generations of, of separation humans kind of do the same things we make the same mistakes we f we we make the same successes we we all value the same things and and so there's something to be said about you know you need to learn history to be able to avoid repeating it repeating the mistakes of history and by losing the stories that we tell, then you lose that history. Um, so yeah, Rakugo is mainly entertainment um, and not really meant to be like a historical type of story, but it, it, I mean, even entertainment, it kind of just shows that people are, have always been the same. We have the vices. We have, you know, you, we all have that idiot friend that does the stupid thing. We all have, like, the, the naughty k kid or the, the, that one friend who's really annoying and um, doesn't really want to follow what everyone else is doing. Like, it's, it just makes it so we understand that people have always been, like, it's a relatability. It's a relatability to our history. So Descending Stories, there's a lot of really wonderful things about it. Um, kind of controversial potential thing in the ending. Um, I'm sure a lot of people know what I'm talking about if you have seen the show or read the manga. Personally, I don't see the introduction of that element as legitimate because the character who suggests it is a character who up like the entire series every one of his suggestions has been wrong or like kind of outlandish and and he's very fanboy and kind of like would would reach for that kind of thing because he likes the idea of you know um him this our main character kind of persisting um and the idea of of um you know the continuation of of and the potential of him but I mean you're free to interpret that however you want but I that's how I interpret it it I do think that it's an element that may be uncomfortable for some but I don't think that that should dissuade you from read reading or watching a series that is so ultimately 
powerful and important. And as I said, like, I don't take that particular um, suggestion seriously because we all know how that character likes to suggest things and mo like every other time it's been just absurd and c quickly, quickly uh, <laughs> um, denied. And also the other character who's like, well, that's just my secret. That's exactly what they do. Like that's just their their nature. And so I think it plays into how these characters interact more so than any actual judgment of the reality of the situation. Again, I don't it I may be completely incorrect, but it I think it's it is open to interpretation and that's how I interpret it. And if it makes it easier for you to interpret it that way, then go ahead and and take my interpretation. I will share it to whomever wants it. Continuing the historical fiction and the character dramas, uh, we have Nasume Ono's House of Five Leaves. This is an eight volume complete series about a kind of shy and nervous samurai who, uh, after being released from the, like, his job, the lord that he was serving under, is kind of wandering around trying to find bodyguard work and runs into a strange man and uh, a larger group of individuals at a tea house or a, a restaurant I guess but generally a tea house um, and he kind of falls into um, just interacting with them and he soon finds out that they are in a group called um, the five leaves or yeah the five leaves who kidnap the young heirs of various houses and holds them for ransom and so they they make money via these kidnappings and then usually they're they're like kind of a Robin Hoodie-esque type of setup because although they are ultimately doing something criminal you do later sort of understand and realize why they are doing this most notably why our main character like mysterious character the head of this group is doing this and why it is so such a personal thing for him to have have done and to apply himself to it's really 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 wonderful it's it's great in the way that Nasme Ono always has her characters and kind of interweaving their stories and it is slow um, kind of quiet and introspective and by having the longer length it allows her to maintain her pretty even paced storytelling and plotline but interspersing and and slowly building up and including the various backgrounds of these characters why they are so <laughs> willing to kidnap people and hold them for ransom what what brought them to this situation and why do they continue this and also how our main character kind of slowly gets involved with this it's so good you guys it's so good the anime is also really good you can buy it um, on right stuff and wherever um, NIS America released it ages ago it is DVD only I own the Australian release which is I think predates the US release by a year or so but it is wonderful and it's just ooh yeah if you like it's not really if you liked Aka 13 which is her other story that is longer um, and it has a very similar style in where it is kind of quiet day-to-day -day life of these characters and you slowly learn more about them but there is an underlying mystery to it that slowly builds and grows and that we get hints of until ultimately being you know revealed and ultimately being shown as to what it is and you know who who these people are and why they're doing this it is so good especially again if you like historical fiction and Nasme Ono you can tell from the cover I really love her art style I think it's very 
uh, like it's almost like Vogue covers. I just think that her character designs are very striking, and I know that are not everyone's cup of tea, but I think they're just so beautiful and really captures the subtleties of the emotions that she tends to do. And I think it also kind of eases you into the general atmosphere of her works into this kind of. I don't know, just this kind of um, introspective moodiness, I think is probably the best way to put that. But House of Five Leaves, completely released by Viz, it is only eight volumes long. It's the longest of her works that is available in English at least, and it is very, 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 very good. On the next shelf we start with a figure, this is the, technically it's a one eighth scale but he's really like a one tenth scale, he's, he's very small, of uh, Takashi Natsume from Natsume's Book of Friends. And this is probably the figure that a lot of people know for this character because it's the oldest of his figures or his high quality kind of scale figures. I bought the re-release because it's been released a couple times. Um, it is very beautiful, it is very lovely, I, it's very tranquil, like it's a really nice um, overall image, a piece of artwork that they base this figure off of. It's just very Natsume, like it's exactly what a Natsume piece should be, although as I said it is very small and when you compare him to like the 1 8th of the Anaplex Natsume that I have, he is teensy in comparison. He's probably the size of a Figma, honestly, like he's he's a little boy. Uh, but it is really nice to have this kind of larger base with a little bit of um, originality to it the, with the branch and the water and of course Nyonko Sensei hanging out the back as he should always be. It's just a beautiful, beautiful put together figure and I don't know if it, you're able to get it anymore because it is probably out of print nowadays um, or hard to like not able to find anymore but he is really lovely and I, I again this was kind of one of my earliest figures that I picked up I was very lucky to get him new. Starting with manga we have Sweet Blue Flowers by Takuko Shimura this is uh, Shimura's lesbian or yuri manga about two girls who were childhood friends um, in childhood obviously and one of them moves away or goes to a different middle school so they kind of lose touch for a while and then they reconnect uh, somewhat unexpectedly in high school. They're not going to the same school but they're going to neighboring schools and in the interim uh, one of our characters Fumi who's the taller one on this uh, cover she has sort of realized her interest um, and her attraction to other girls. She has a unrequited or uh, generally unrequited relationship with her cousin I think it is um, who she is recently getting married so she's kind of broken off that relationship but her cousin was sort of her first foray into lesbianism and um, relationships with other girls and then slowly you um, there's a lot of really interesting discussions on um, you know romance and feelings and whether something is whether you're interested in someone because you have a history together or whether you're actually attracted to them um, there's a lot of really good representation as to because uh, when you're a teenager you make some dumb decisions um, so there this is definitely like a, a drama and it does focus around various various um, characters we do have I think really this is a good good representation of not just lesbian girls but also bisexual girls and um, which is something that isn't really that shown in Yuri manga. Um, usually it's like all or nothing, right? So there's quite a few characters. I'd say, I would argue there's probably at least two, maybe even three of these characters who are bisexual. 
Um, and because of that, I think, and because of their complicated relationships with each other, there is a lot of making dumb decisions, like trying to go into a relationship in order to forget another relationship, the kind of stuff that we as people always do, but there's never going to be like a happy ending to that kind of thing if you go into something wanting to forget someone else if that makes sense um, but still being preoccupied with that other person I think it also handles a lot of the side characters very well and their personal drama but of course the main couple or the main characters are what you should be reading reading for and uh, they are it's really it's really good to see how again like this isn't inherently unique to this series and I don't think it's you know invented this but I do think it it poses a lot of questions very well and handles a lot of questions very well as to um, when you are interested in someone that you have a previous relationship are you interested in them for who they are or are you interested in them because they're familiar to you if you know what I mean Does that makes sense um, which is I think a very real thing regardless of your sexuality I think people kind of not settle but they kind of are orbit towards people who um, are already in their immediate vicinity <laughs> and thus like their relationships grow from people they already know whether or not they may be well suited and thankfully for these two girls I think it's also pretty indicative of real life that for people I think there's been studies about if you know someone in childhood and then spend years apart and then reconnect with that person you're you're more likely to like stay with that person um, it's really interesting it's really interesting but Tako Shimura, I really love her manga. I think she does a great job. Um, Wandering Sun, I talked about in the last video, is one of my absolute favorites. Um, and it, this poor series had kind of a cursed release. It was licensed digitally a couple times and then never fully released in its entirety up until Viz finally released it and these two-in-one omnibuses. So it's an eight-volume series, but we have four uh, two-in-ones and it's just it's really lovely but I do think that Shimura you need to be aware that Shimura's style is kind of like with Nasume Ono it's kind of um, even probably more so uh, you don't there's a major plot but each chapter is kind of just a quick snippet into these characters like no, each chapter doesn't follow immediately after the events of the previous chapter so you can feel like you're kind of jumping around a bit because you are jumping around that's you you don't have to you don't see every single thing and every single interaction and every single conversation or fight or whatever else in the series a lot of it is up to just implication and interpretation and clues that we get from later conversations or later interactions but I think that gives it an organic feel because we as readers are, um, you know, we're experiencing this as just momentary glances into these characters' lives, which works, um, I think, a little bit better when you're a monthly series and you have, you know, the however 25 to 40 page chapter every month little less so in the collected volumes which I do think means like I recommend reading her series and like little short chunks you get little bits at a time her series are not ones to like try and blitz through in an afternoon because I don't think people feel like they're satisfyingly following a, a story if when they do that I don't know I mean it might be different for other people but I think her stories are, are ones to be savored and ones that you take a chapter at a time, have some time to digest, and then you can kind of compare and mentally go through and, and almost problem solve or like put yourself in that situation and kind of anticipate 
the character's next moves as well. It's very good. It's another Yuri title, like with um, Kase-san, and that I would recommend to a lot of people as like a starting Yuri. I think this one tends like a little bit into it almost feels like uh, more of an LGBT manga than purely Yuri, but I mean they're a little bit um, interchangeable terms for some people, so I don't know if that really gives like a specificity. Uh, but it is very, very good. And I like all of the main four girls that this focuses on. Again, like with Kase-san and, I really like that this w isn't really a Yuritopia. It exists in a world where, you know, other people exist. I think both girls go to an old girls school, but they have like male figures and presences in their lives. So both these girls have their dads. Um, one of the girls has an older brother. Um, one of the girls has a fiance um, or it's like a betrothed childhood friend who she's known forever. Um, so there are like other people that exist in this world um, and impact these characters' lives, which is I, I like because I like that it kind of exists in the real world. Um, not everything has to, of course, but I prefer this kind of storytelling in my Yuri compared to like everyone's just a lesbian and they're all, everyone's just dating each other because there's only girls in this world and that's all we need to focus on. I'm just like, okay, that's fine. But like, I don't, that's not my preferred type of Yuri. This, I think really has the good balance of focusing on these these women, these young women and their stories and their interests and their attractions and their personal relationships, but it also has that element. It gives it, it just, for me, it gives it a levity that when it feels like it could actually exist in the real world when we're talking about like a romance type of story or one that it has to do with personal relationships and romance. Um, I prefer them when they do exist in the real world, like this one. Next is my favorite Urasawa work. This is Pluto uh, by Naoke Urasawa and based off of a Astro Boy um, chapter or storyline from Osamu Tezuka, obviously. This is a wonderful sci-fi story about um, the future in which androids exist and are fairly prolific and um, a particular very well-known beloved android has been murdered and thus we have our main character who is another android but he is a detective um, on the case to kind of find out what happened who would have murdered this other android and so within the original Tezuka story, obviously Astro Boy or Adam um, was the main character and Astro Boy is in this story but he's not, it's from a different perspective, it's from our detective perspective and so that gives a really interesting twist to this story. I think it, by focusing on the investigation of the police work, it really plays into the strengths of Urasawa's work. I, I talked about Monster already. I think he, he really does this kind of crime thriller and mystery very, very well. Um, 20th Century Boys, although not strictly uh, a crime type of story, it, it plays into these, these ideas as well. So I think it was smart of him to refocus and reframe this story. And I... I mentioned with uh, Monster and 20th Century Boys that um, I find a lot of Urasawa's works, for as much as I love them, they are a little bit overblown. Like, they they go on a little bit too long. I think they can be tightened up. This one doesn't suffer from that nearly as much because it is focused on someone else's writing and storyline. I think it, it is more streamlined and it it really does focus on the important parts a lot in a lot more effective way compared to some of his longer works which is why this is my absolute like 
must recommend for Urasawa. This is also getting a anime adaptation. I didn't, also didn't mention it, but uh, Sweet Blue Fires also has an anime adaptation, just by the way. But Pluto is getting an anime adaptation uh, this coming year, which is super exciting. Uh, hopefully that will encourage more people to watch this, or read this series. My sister is currently reading this series. I, <laughs> she got to one part and then like had to stop because it made her cry too hard. Um, so, you know, that's how my family is. Um, but within the eight volumes, it really does focus a lot on the mentality of brutality and senseless killing and also the, the, um, the mentality and the pressures of being the best in your class, in your, in your craft, um, excelling and exceeding others who are within the same industry which is a big part because in the Astro Boy storyline it's like the eight strongest androids in the world and they all have a different focus and they're slowly being killed off um, throughout the series um, so that only the strongest like remains it's an interesting it's an interesting idea and Pluto does it really really well I I really enjoy this one and I think a lot of people know this one um, but it you don't need to know anything about Astro Boy to read this one I think it's it's a very good standalone series as well and I think the kind of dystopic future society cyberpunk type of society that is kind of hinted at in Astro Boy it really comes to the forefront in this particular particular manga and I again I think it, that's mainly due to Urasawa playing to his strengths so yeah wonderful wonderful series I highly recommend it next is Planetess by Makoto Yukimura the same mangaka as Vinland Saga this is the two omnibus release from Dark Horse this was also previously previously released by Tokyo Pop in five volumes so it's the five volume series just re-released in omnibus form uh i i love this series a lot but i will say that i think the anime adaptation adapts this in the best way that it can this one it does have sort of an overarching theme and a lot of recurring characters but i think they're very um interwoven somewhat disconnected stories to make this whole this whole book it's kind of various vignettes that don't really go anywhere ultimately like it's a little bit it builds towards the main ish characters story arc and the people that he interacts with but there's no clear cut story arc right um, whereas the anime kind of reshuffles things, it adapts things, it adds certain elements as well. It's not like a pure adaptation to this series, but I, it does give very clear character arcs, which is what I think this, this series does need for you to get fully invested in the characters. But regardless, this manga is wonderful. I think Yukimura has a great sense of scale and if you're a fan of space and space travel and the idea of humans going to space and a future in which humanity has like is is regularly traveling to space then this one is definitely for you i think if you enjoy the mysteries and the grandness of our solar system and our universe then this one is very very good i think also um again like like kind of comparable with Kaoru mori there's a huge amount of um i guess research that goes into this there's a huge amount of accuracy and um in in space travel and the potential future of space travel within the series uh, if you don't know what this is, it's it's about a series, uh, well, it's about a group of basically space janitors. They go around collecting de debris from all through the solar system in an effort to prevent 
um, you know, accidents because debris in space, because, uh, because there's no air in space, once an item or once something, an object is in motion, there's no friction to stop it down. So potentially it stays in motion for ever, like it will never stop. Um, and it's only through like gravitational pulls of planets and things like that that can actually change trajectories of objects depending on their size and yada yada yada. But when, you, when you're traveling through a vacuum, when you're traveling through um, somewhere where there is no, no air, no, no real like elements whatsoever around you, you, because there's no friction, you can potentially go at thousands, hundreds of thousands of kilometers per hour and travel at super speeds, which is what happens. Like that, this is all real science. Um, and so what they do is they collect junk, things that have fallen off of satellites or whatever, things that have broken off, um, in an effort to prevent these free drifting or free moving, potentially very deadly projectiles hitting satellites, space stations, rockets, whatever, whatever. Um, because even the tiniest little nail fragment of something, uh, when it hits other objects at such high velocity, it absolutely destroys them and of course you know, causes even more debris. Um, which again is something that is very real um, and is something that I think if you follow again like a lot of space series both in um, you know western media and in manga things like um, Space Brothers which is wonderful uh, but even like Dr. Stone has elements of this or the Dr. Stone spin-off talks about this kind of thing um, it's not, this is not in something that is new or unaware for, for scientists and people, you know, actively being astronauts and working in space. Um, so yeah, like it, it's really, really interesting and it's a very important job, but for our characters, it's kind of like a, you know, a janitor is always, I think, going to be perceived as kind of a, a scummy, like a, like lowest rung type of type of occupation and without much respect but these these people are doing a very valuable service and then so one of our characters within this group of junk haulers and, and cleaners or whatever um, wants to become like a proper astronaut quote unquote and he's hoping to join a a trip to to Jer Jupiter in in um kind of, I guess, assessing being able to terraform it. Who knows? Uh, it's been a little while since I read this. But it, there, because there's, it's a whole group of people, you get a lot of different perspectives, you get a lot of their different backgrounds and a lot of different motivations as to why they're here. It's very good. Yukimura's art is beautiful. Um, but as I said, I think the anime... It, I mean, it's not a perfect series, but I think it does give a more clear-cut character arc. But again, I can't... It's hard for me to recommend the anime because I'm pretty sure it's super-duper out of print everywhere. Uh, which is a shame. Again, yeah, it's... Ugh, ugh. But this, this manga is readily available from Dark Horse. I know that uh, some people were worried it was out of print for a while, which it, the second volume, I think, was hard to find. Dark Horse is on a very weird printing schedule, so sometimes their books will go for, you know, they'll disappear from from shelves for a while, and then um, so all of the secondhand and third party sellers crank the prices up. So, but generally just wait because they'll put it in another print run, and then you'll get you'll get one for retail. I my attitude is like don't buy dark horse things for from third parties just in general because nine times out of ten it'll get a reprint um especially for like recent recent volumes i know people were stressing about blade of the immortal already being out of print but those volumes are are back in print or going back into print and being going to be available this month so just wait just have some patience um 
you know, it's it's not going to be the end of the world. And I know I know that like Dark Horse up until the last couple of years have has gained this reputation. I mean, there's a there's fair reason to be worried about it, but I do think they're actively trying to be better about keeping their manga in print and like expanding their li- manga library, which is a really good thing to see. But yeah, Planetess, really great. Um, obviously an earlier work of Yukimura's and if you like space, if you like space travel and sort of near future stuff involving space travel, check this one out. Ooh, also before I forget, with Planetess, um, it, similarly to Children of the Sea, it really has a lot of themes of like humanity's place and role within this like huge, wide, unfeeling system um, cause really like as a single human, our impact on the world is like totally dwarfed by the expansiveness of space and also in children of the sea of the ocean. So like as the awareness of our own tininess in comparison to the universe is like a huge part of Planetas. And if that sounds like your thing, then check it out as well. Next is the complete omnibus of In This Corner of the World. It's just a single volume by Fumio Kono. I showed off the film adaptation of this earlier and I also showed off another one of Kono's works. This is about a young woman uh, and a new, a newly wedded young woman and her life, her day-to-day life with her husband and her husband's family in, um, in wartime um, Hiroshima. Well, she's from Hiroshima. Her her husband and his family live like just in the town or so over. So they're right in the thick of it. Her husband is a Navy engineer, I think, and her, her father-in-law also works um, like as a as a naval engineer. They're like, they're not within the armed forces, but they're like manufacturers and they build ships. And that's why If you don't know history, like this is why Hiroshima was bombed, it's because all of the Navy was getting their ships made there. Like that's that's why Hiroshima was a target for for America. But so this is um, her life, her day to day life um, during the war period um, and living in Hiroshima prior to the bombings and just um, her personal like struggles with being you know a new new wife and also obviously the stress and the struggles of living in an area that was focused and kind of one of the center points of the war in Japan uh, it's it's very very good I do think that the like with um, Planetess, I do think that the anime adaptation is a little bit more streamlined and I think it adapts the best parts of this manga. Um, but it is a very beautiful um, and genuine and just emotional and empathetic look at the day, the how hard the day-to-day life for the general person was. Um, in in Japan during the war um, and obviously the impact of the war on the general populace and of course the impact of the bombings on the general populace it's I think I said it before but Kono has a great sympathy and empathy for those from Hiroshima and the, like the the city of Hiroshima and the people of Hiroshima um, from a period when they really were, you know, they were struggling. And I think it's kind of, it's such a shame and almost disgusting in how these people were treated after the the Hiroshima bombings by the Japanese. Like they were shunned, they were, you know, the refugees were totally, um, you know, looked down upon and rejected by the rest of Japan, which is incredibly heartbreaking. But a lot of the story is about hope and new beginnings and finding something to live for in a very hopeless story where a lot of people didn't, weren't able to survive, weren't able 
to to live their lives happily afterwards. There's a lot of really great moments of loss, poignant poignant moments of struggle that from the Western perspective is pretty interesting to see. I think, like, I can always be a little bit, I don't, I don't want to say critical because that's not really the right word, but a lot of the story, I, I talked about this with a wind, the, the Wind Rises and Grave of the Fireflies as well. There's, I think there's, there's definite, um, reason to be somewhat skeptical as to wartime stories from Japan just because of how Japan represents itself but it is important to understand like how many people were affected how many innocent people on both sides you know war war everything's fair in love and war as they say and like so many people wartime affects so many innocent people so many innocent lives um just by just by it it existing just by the function of it and so it is very important that we do have stories like in this corner of the world and barefoot gen and grave of the fireflies um but it's just as important to have stories like showa from shigeru mizuki and um, onward towards our noble death also by mizuki like there there's needs to be a very balanced look at this time period and i think kono rather than i i like her work in particular because rather than i guess trying to justify and glorify japan's involvement with the war and what was happening um it really is focused on the people who were impacted who should never have been impacted um and again like i said and i think like with a uh, barefoot again it has this understanding of a displaced peoples and how they are just as human and normal and you know whatever as the rest of the population was they were just subject to a absolute atrocity um and then unfortunately not not treated nearly as as well as they should have been um but yeah like it i think there's there's a lot of very valuable stuff to be gained from these stories especially um if you don't know or watch a lot of like war stuff from the japanese perspective but again like i think you got to be a little bit um aware of like what you're what you're reading and watching when it comes to this genre and be aware of you know their propaganda still exists guys that's like something that's still out there and japan ain't afraid to utilize it um but yeah this particular story and this particular woman story i think it's very likable. I think there's a lot to love from her and I think she's a great main character and uh she's not she's kind of innocent. She's kind of naive which which gives it a lot more pathos when uh she is suffering from a lot like a lot of loss. She loses so much throughout this, but ultimately sees hope for a future and sees hope with the people who remain. Um yeah, there's there's some great stuff here and it is a single volume. Um I know some people don't like the art style which um I mean they're they're lost. I think people are like, "Oh, it looks too much like peanuts." I don't like Charlie Brown and Snoopy type of thing. I don't know. I don't agree. Um but I I think it's a very cute kind of simple style without being like cute C and uh I think Kono does a great great job with her stories and I think the power of the writing uh should circumvent any kind of issues you may have with the art but hey that's just me we all know that I I like some pretty um atypical art to the more popular stuff it just in general and I'm sure you guys watching do as well So yeah, in this corner of the world is a pretty solid wartime look at day-to-day life in Hiroshima and the impact that 
the bombs had on on normal people and uh yeah trying to survive through through trauma and through disaster like that finally for the shelf uh speaking of trauma uh we have not simple by nuts mayono this is probably one that a lot of people may have been introduced to Ono's work through. Uh, this is a single volume about, um, really it's about a young boy or like a young man, Australian just as well, by the way, um, and his, and a, a reporter who has been kind of following his life, as it were. Um, I know, uh, I, I know Ray from Whimsical Pictures doesn't like this manga, which is perfect, like I can totally understand why, because she dislikes it for the same reasons she and I dislike Goodnight Pun Pun, in that the main character, like his life is terrible, and so many bad things happen to him, and it's kind of a senseless, senseless thing, like why, why does life have to be, like why does so many bad things have to happen to him? which I totally get like that's not always a fun thing to read about but I think this is a pretty interesting story about an individual's life who has all has been terrible pretty consistently from the day he was born up until the end of the story and but but his optimism through that um and I mean I hate to say it and it is kind of like it's a very Arsenault-esque uh, theming to this. But sometimes, you know, life just doesn't have, like, suffering and disappointment and bad things happening in life don't always have a purpose. They don't, they don't happen to the people that deserve it. And sometimes life is just rough. And sometimes it's really rough. And sometimes you just can't get a break from it. And, uh... I think this character's name is Isaac, uh, Isaac, he, his optimism, his hope throughout the series, despite that, is powerful, and I think it is worth reading, but, oh man, yeah, it is like a rough read, um, there's a lot of dark themes to do with, uh, sexual assault and rape, there's a lot of dark themes of, um, drug use, physical abuse, um, HIV, there's a lot of, there's a lot of, like, very, like, full-on themes here, so it's not for everyone, but I do think that it is a good read, like, regardless, I think it, ha Ono handles a lot of those themes very well, and it balances it well, and it, the interaction and the relationship between our main character and well the two main characters and this this compel this compulsion and like this interest um that this uh journalist has for this other this you know younger young guy is is really interesting to see how like compelled he is with his story and the struggles that he's gone through and his attitude regardless of all of the bad things that have happened to him. I think it's a really interesting piece and I I, I actually like it a lot. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I totally get why people would dislike this one or why people wouldn't want to read this one. And I, I mean, all I have to say is at least it's only one volume <laughs> compared to the 13 or whatever that um, good night, Poon Poon is. <laughs> That's just like overwhelmingly bleak for 13 volumes in a row. At least this is overwhelmingly bleak for one volume. <laughs> so, you know, but not simple. It's an interesting one, and I don't think a huge amount of people know about it now, but it is very easy to get. It's quite, um, you know, it's, it's not rare. I don't think, I don't know if it's in print, but it's one that you can find very cheaply, um, from secondhand sellers and things like that. Viz put this one out just by the way as well, if I didn't mention that. Uh, and this is kind of an earlier work of, of Ono's as well. And so maybe that might, the art style, her art style is kind of a little bit more 
I don't want to say cartoony, but it looks kind of different to her current style, which is a lot more refined. I don't know. It's an interesting one, and I like it. I do need to reread it. It's been a little while since I've read it. On the next shelf is pretty much a huge part of my oversized and oversized hardcover uh, manga. So we have first is Tech on Kingcrete. Uh, this is the only non-hardcover that I have on this shelf. Or Tech on Kingcrete Black and White uh, by Taiyo Matsumoto. This is probably the most well-known, aside from Ping Pong, of his works. It does have a film adaptation, which is very, very, very good. Um, I talked about it with when I was talking about my anime films, but this is a story of two street kids um, living in the concrete jungle, as it were, and their relationship with each other, the relationship with the other street kids, um, the the various tensions amongst the yakuza and like the the adults within this area, and sort of just the bad situation that these kids are in that they don't even really realize they're in. Um, a huge part of this story is about, you know, the responsibility of adults to children and also this generation of not wanting to repeat the cycles of, of and the bad choices of the previous generation. Really, really great. We have uh, these two, I, we, there's never really said that they're like actually brothers, but these two kids are brothers in their own beliefs. And then we have, so the older one is black, the younger one is white. And black's sort of the, the one who gets things done. He looks after white, he's responsible, he makes sure that they get fed, and that they're surviving day to day. And he's also the one that goes on this larger spiral of wanting vengeance and and feeling frustrated and wanting to lash out at the changes that the city is going through and he's the one most in danger in becoming the the type of adults that you know he doesn't want to be and that are are you know ruining the whole the whole area, um, the vicious kind of violent, heartless criminals uh, that the area has become notable for. And then comparatively, white is kind of like the, how do I phrase this? Like, I don't quite remember what the literary term is, but he's very innocent, very naive, um, kind of simple. But he's the counterpoint to Black. He's the one that has this childish optimism, who has like a very fantastical and just simple way of looking at the world. But he, he's really Black's tie to, to his own humanity. He's the one who keeps him from spiraling into the darkest parts of his mind. And so they really, they function as a pair, but then throughout the series, at one point in the series, they get separated and thus, um, you know, things start to go wrong. It is an incredible, incredible manga. Um, this has had a couple releases. It had like an old, old, old Viz release where it was two volumes and then they re-released it in this large all-in-one edition. Um, there's not a huge amount of these like large, large, big trim size things that Viz put out, um, sort of at the midpoint, like late 2000s, maybe 2010-ish type of period. But this one, I think, is still in print. You can still get it. I don't know. But it is one that I do recommend. And again, if you're a Matsumoto fan, you should read it. And you should watch the film because it's a fantastic adaptation of the story. Next we start with Fantagraphic Books releases and some releases from one of my favorite mangaka. This is Moto Hage, A Drunken Dream and other stories. This is a collection of her short story works. I actually bought mine secondhand. It's kind of a little bit beat up on the spine, but it's perfect. I don't really mind that. 
Um, it's in perfect reading condition. But this is a collection of Hagia's short, like, single chapter stories. Some really interesting stuff all throughout her career from the 70s all the way till I think 2008-ish was the last or the most recent story that was included in this collection. Uh, most notably is uh, Iguana Girl, which is one of her most well-known works. And then also Hanshin Half God, which is incredible and again one of her most notable like single chapter works. So, uh, but there's a whole there's a whole bunch of them. But those two I think are the ones that, if nothing else, like even if you don't like the uh, rest of the book, those are the ones worth reading. Uh, Iguana Girl is about a girl who um, looks like an iguana. She she perceives herself as an iguana and her mother continually rejects her. She, I don't think that she looks like an iguana to everyone else aside from perhaps her mother and herself whenever she looks in her reflection, whenever she looks at her body, she just looks like an iguana. Um, and every so often she'll, she'll see other people, other just like living in society who are other different animals, cows, bird, like whatever it is, um, and see them kind of be unaware of their own unhumanness. And you, she later finds out the relationship of her being an iguana and her, the issue she has with her mother. That's a huge theme in a lot of Hagia's uh, work is, is mother issues, issues with, with, between mothers and daughters very very relevant to her and her life and so she writes about it a lot but very 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 good Hanshin Half God uh similarly is about uh is it identical twins and um yeah it's identical twins but one one of the girls is absolutely beautiful perfect you know glowing and then the other I think they may be conjoined twins and yeah, so they're conjoined twins. One of the twins is just like a perfect, gorgeous little doll of a girl. And then the other one is basically like a husk, uh, really no vibrancy, no life to her whatsoever. And they ultimately get separated. And the, the husk twin, um, she kind of curses her sister. She, she believes that her life is being slowly sucked away. Her vitality is being sucked away. Um, no. Ooh, it's been a while since I read this one as well. One of the sisters, um, she wants to remove the, the husk, like her, her twin, to get rid of this kind of gross, scary um, part of her, piece of her, um, and, and her sibling. And... Uh, once they're separated, they things f kind of like s turn on their heads and things change, and it's uh, definitely a moral play. I can't remember exact. It's been a while. I need to get. The, I need to pull this one out and reread it. I'll do that later this week. But it's very very good. Uh, Hagia has some really interesting themes that she plays with, and uh, this this collection of short stories she really gets to dive into a lot of a lot of the stuff that. It was pretty prolific throughout her works. Next is the most recent Fantagraphics books release that I bought, the most recent of Hagia's work that's been released. Uh, this is the Poe Clan Volume 1, which collects the first half of this five volume series, I believe. Um, wonderful, wonderful, um, wonderful story about it's a European setting, vampires, uh, various chapter, like single chapter focused. And it's told in a really interesting non-linear way about the day-to-day -day lives and, and the various people, the various interactions that these vampire siblings, family, whatever, uh, in the, how they exist and the, the various people they interact with and how things change or don't change over time because as vampires they don't really have a, 
perception of time because they're immortal they don't die it's very beautiful um very hagio <laughs> um you know very 70s it, this when this was licensed i think myself and a couple other people uh we just we just partied like we honestly we were so um excited and happy about this uh, so we just were screaming about it for days weeks months years possibly um from the moment this was licensed up until the moment we got this first volume uh there's been a lot of excitement within my circle of friends and people who i follow on twitter um for this book it's just it's a classic it's one of Hagio's most well-known works and it's so nice to have it being released in English. This is, oh, I just, more 70s shoujo in print, please. I, just, I beg, please. It's so wonderful. And I cannot wait for volume two. Um, yeah, this is compared to, because Hagia has like two different speeds. She has her sci-fi stuff and then she has her like more classic European uh, stuff and this is obviously very on that end of the spectrum versus her sci-fi stuff it's beautiful dramatic heart-wrenching uh, thrilling and but at the same time kind of the first to have this non-linear slice of life kind of um, odd way of telling the story and it was it was somewhat revolutionary in that it allowed people to get join start the story at any point um so if you weren't reading it from the very beginning that wasn't a problem because it, obviously like it jumps around the, there's no linear structure to this and it might make it difficult to read for some people but i like it's very purposeful it plays into the themes and the settings for these characters and it's just, it's done really, really good. I really love it. And such a beautiful release from Fantagraphics as per usual. Another Hagia release with Otherworld Barbara, uh, volume one and two. This is the complete four volume series. Again, by Fantagraphics books. Be oh, oh, oh. This one is definitely on her sci-fi side. Um, it's kind of a thriller mystery about a young girl who sleeps who never wakes and then a, a boy who keeps seeing her within his dreams and kind of contacting her through his dreams it is very uh it's very obtuse it's one that's kind of a little bit um <laughs> hard to unpack it's it's very um it doesn't like to be obvious with its story and i think that just builds into the dreamlike quality of this story yeah i mean i'm just this is a more recent work of hagia's i think 2008 ish so it's not like super duper new but it is newer than compared to like the po clan which is from the 70s um it's just incredible that we have gotten so much of her work in in english mostly due to fantagraphics books and the wonderful hard work of the translator Rachel Thorne. She's done a phenomenal job on all of Hagia's work ever since the very beginning. It's one, this particular series I think is maybe easier to recommend for people who aren't super willing to jump into like the, the dramatic flamboyancy <laughs> of, of 70s shoujo. This really does, like it's weird it's obtuse it it's kind of hard to understand you're not it's one again that you have to read a couple times i think to get more out of it um so in that way i'd say it's very literary and it again plays to a lot of the themes of this dreamlike quality of this mystery of this just not quite knowing what to expect with this series. Um, yeah, I think it's a little bit easier to recommend to people, but like with all Fantagraphics books, it's hard to recommend because they are big and expensive. And I mean, they're totally worth the money. They're, they're high quality, so, so such high quality. But 
for a general manga reader, it is not like their first priority, especially for um, a mangaka like Hagio, who, um, you know, is so influential and so important and has done so much for the the art form. But most people don't really know who she is, so they're not going to be following her books, unfortunately. But read this read uh po clan and read the next one although it is like very hard to find i think it's yeah it's a very interesting like out of print type of series the next one i'll talk about it then so next is the heart of thomas um the series that is credited for basically inventing this kind of classic literature european setting for shoujo manga um and a lot of people regard this as, I guess, inventing or normalizing, popularizing BL or proto-BL within Japan. Um, there were other mangaka also doing this, but I think The Heart of Thomas had the widest, the widest variety, like, popularity and reach. And so this is kind of the starting point for that genre. Um, in saying that, this is a 70s manga and it's not like super duper explicit or anything and it's quite dark in a lot of its themes um it is a drama so be aware of that like don't avoid this one because you're not wanting to read like explicit gay you know sex scenes or something like you might find in a more typical bl yaoi it's not that um but this really defined a generation <laughs> and really influenced so many series that came after it. But this is a story of um, a boarding school in Germany and our main character, he has returned from the, the vacation period to discover that one of the underclassmen has killed himself and uh, his letter um, kind of suicide letter kind of implies that he killed himself because his feelings for our main character were um, not reciprocated. So it's his, it's our main character's struggles with the guilt and feeling responsible for this young boy's death and then also his struggles with his own feelings and acceptance of who he is and um, his issues with the other boys in the school, his issues with his family and his place in his family, um, and then his the late realization of how he truly felt about this other younger boy who commits suicide. It's, oh, drama. Um, it's very good. It, it's phenomenal. Uh, yeah, honestly, like, if you're going to read any of Hagio's work, this one has probably, this and Po Clan have definitely had, and I mean, I said they were 11 as well, but that's not in print and easy to find. Uh, these are must reads, but again, like it's out of print, but in, and not always super duper, like super expensive out of print. So maybe wait if you're wanting a copy to try and get one for a reasonable price. It's so beautiful. It's such a lovely release. And it is such an important work in manga history that it's kind of a shame that a lot of people don't know about it or avoid it. It is wonderful. I cannot recommend this one enough, but it is one for people who are interested in you know, manga history in very influential classics in shoujo classics, uh, 70s shoujo, Hagio's work, and um, yeah, sort of the evolution of manga throughout the his throughout its history and, and how demographics have changed and how readership has changed and all these other lovely things. Changing things up a bit with uh, Inio Asano work. This is the only of Asano's work that Fantagraphics has put out, but this is Niji Gahara Holograph, a mystery uh, series kind of about, well, how to explain this one? Uh, it's definitely about 
memories and responsibility and secrets. Um, it it's about in in childhood. Uh, there was a group of kids who I believe like bullied one of the kids, and then that kid shows up dead. And so there's a lot of mystery as to if these other kids were involved. And then throughout the town, um, like mysterious butterflies or moths are showing up everywhere. And these these it has been many years later, and these kids who are now adults are kind of struggling with trying to remember the the full extent of it and some who are feeling guilty some who are wanting the truth some who like there's a lot of conflict here it is a one that I think you need to read a lot of times because it's not like very clear cut to the reality of the situation it reminds me a lot of thematically and kind of tone wise as well it reminds me a lot of the digital series, uh, or a series you can buy digitally, uh, from Kodansha, which is Until Your Bones Rot, which, oh boy, content warning for that one. I don't get squeamish by much in manga, um, but that one, oh my goodness, um, it's, it's a ride. So it, avoid that if you're not one, if you're someone who's, like for me, um, yeah, I don't get squeamish by much. I listen to, like, very, a lot of true crime type of media, a lot. Uh, so I'm listening to, like, violent crime and murder all of the time, and Until Your Bones Rot was pretty tough to read. Uh, this isn't nearly as visceral as that, but there's definite, like, huge mystery surrounding this whole incident and these people's involvement and whether or not the truth should come out and how it should come out and what is the actual truth of this situation there it's it's really good it's really good it's honestly probably my favorite of Asno's work outside of Da 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 Destruction but I think this one is also out of print I don't know um, it's kind of an older Fantagraphics release and they don't always keep their books in you know super duper uh, available print because they're kind of a niche boutique publisher. Next we have Jiro Tanaguchi's A Distant Neighborhood by Ponent Mon or Fanfare. Uh, you can maybe tell that this is a flipped release which is fairly typical for Ponent Mon um, and for their older Tanaguchi works but this is the story of a middle-aged man who returns to his hometown after his mother is hospitalized and um, whilst wandering around the streets of um, Totori, or his, his city in Totori, um, he wakes up or um, regains consciousness as his 15-year-old self. So he's kind of given an opportunity to relive his youth and uh, given the opportunity to change things in his life, make different relationships with people, and ultimately try and find the truth of the situation um, with his father who abandoned the family when he was 15 years old. Um, it's really interesting, again like with again, I mean, again like with again, but similarly to again it, it poses this story of like if you're given a second chance um, would you and how would you use that responsibility and do you really want to know the truth of the situations um, Tanaguchi this is this and The Walking Man is are by far his most well-known works and I think for good reason they're very powerful and this is the best of Tanaguchi like this is there's something just very not melancholic but something that ruminates on the nostalgia of the situation that as the older the older you get the more aware of the rose tinted life the easiness of your life prior to your current like adulthood um but then also if given the chance to be a kid again how how much of that was just the rose tinted nostalgia of getting older and how much was like actual freedom and carefree days it's really 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 good I mean how many times have I said that for this whole bookshelf but 
I'm really looking forward to um, Ponet Mon's re-release of The Walking Man. I'm hoping that they ship my copy soon because I've seen that Amazon is starting to ship them out and I pre-ordered it when it was announced. <laughs> so hopefully, fingers crossed, I'll see it. Um, but yeah, this is a marvelous introspective character piece about choices and the past and um also like family and responsibility and and trauma um a large part of the the reason that his fault that he realizes later on in his life that the, his father left them is because of the experiences his father had um as a younger person and it's it's really really good really good and it's set in Totori which is not a prefecture that gets a lot of um interest but is uh is like I I am aware of it because that's where free is set <laughs> me, me being a fangirl but it is the least populous state or prefecture of Japan and it's well it, like it's famous for sand dunes and that's about it. Fishing and sand dunes and just curry as well. They they like their curry. Um, but it's like interesting to see kind of uh, quietly post-war uh, Totori when, you know, it's just a small town with nothing going on. And as a young person that this being stifled by that environment, feeling like you have to escape that. Which is something that I feel because my where I live is um, it's a capital city, but it's <laughs> it's very quiet. It's very small town. Finally, for Fantagraphics books, or finally for the shelf, is another Fantagraphics books release. Another Takuko Shimura release. This is the entirety of what we got in English for Wandering Sun, so volumes one to eight, roughly halfway, just over halfway. Um, I mean, I talked about this series in the last video, but this is a character story, coming of age story about two transgender kids, who one who is a trans boy, one who is a trans girl. The trans girl is kind of the focus of the piece, but it is a story about the both of them, and it follows their lives and their struggles and their the various things that they go through. Um, from primary school all the way up until high school graduation. This uh, volume 8 is middle school for them, so we don't fully, obviously, we just with it being a 15 volume series in its entirety, we don't, at 8 volumes, we don't get the whole, the whole series, but um, we do get a solid chunk of it, and I do hope that one day we may see more, although that is very, very unlikely, unfortunately. Um, Again, Shimura writes with such empathy. She just I love how she writes her characters. And for me, this was my first introduction to um, any kind of medium and media that portrayed trans characters and trans issues with such empathy. Um, it wasn't used as a joke. It wasn't used as kind of... Um, you know, a tragic story, ultimately. It was more so just a look at these characters' lives and what they go through and sort of the struggles of being in that situation and not feeling like you're fully yourself and you're fully um, how you should be. It is so good. Similarly to Sweet Blue Flowers, it is kind of a little bit of a collection of vignettes, but I do think that there's something a bit more powerful into looking into these characters lives and their personal struggles and seeing how much they change and grow over the course of the series that is very very valuable and I love it I love it a whole lot it um it makes me happy it makes me sad and I I hope that someday it might not be from Fantagraphics but I hope someday we do see this series available in English in its entirety legally somewhere. So yeah. On the shelves we have some more art books. These are generally my I guess nicer, my favorite art books. They're also usually hardcover or a, a four size. Um, so there's not really a theme here but 
uh, I do, you guys know me, I love my art books, and these are some of my favorite ones. So first one we have um, is this one, which is to do with, um, what is it, Atelier, something to do with, Atelier. I can't remember that what this show is called, or what this manga is called, but it is available in um, English from Kodansha digitally. It is a pretty solid little action series set in kind of a um, alternate uh, ancient Turkey type of thing or historical Turkey. It's pretty interesting. Um, uh, I cannot remember for the life of me. Who knows? Who knows? But it's a beautiful art book and even if you um, don't read the series then this art book, but you're an art book collector, this one is a must get in my opinion. It is absolutely beautiful. Next to that is, uh, what is this one? Oh, The Twelve Kingdoms, which is of course a series that I adore. This is various artwork from the light novels and from like calendars and various things. It's, it's beautiful, both color and black and white artwork. And yeah, I mean, oh, I, I had wanted this art book for a long time and then I finally found it uh, cheap from Mandarake. So I'm super happy that I was able to track, track copy down because it was, a, it was kind of a glaring um, emptiness, a glaring, uh, yeah, just absence from my collection. Next to that is the is a one of the Shimizu Reiko's illustration collections. This is Aria, which contains various artworks, most notably from Moonchild, which is the only one of her series I think we ever got in English. Maybe I don't remember. Um, well, it's the only one of her works that I have in English. If it's not the only work that, but I love her style. Oh my gosh, it's so. Oh, it's so 80s slash 90s. It's so perfect. She has a whole bunch of art books. Um, I'm hoping to get some of the other ones at some point as well. What is this? These are like clear file type stuff. We have Time of Eve, one from the Kickstarter. What's this? Oh, Little Witch Academia. Um, this is the some of the key art from one of the Kickstarters, likely. Is that? Yeah. And then... Oh yeah, this is for more key art for uh, Tech and Concrete. The art book, the um, crowdfunded art book. And then here's more time, time of Eve stuff from crowdfunding. So these are all from crowdfunding stuff. Uh, this one is the box for the illustration works for number two of the free, of free, but it actually has both books in there. These are books that, oh, Kyoto Animation puts out every so often, which just has basically all of the promotional artwork for free. This book and this book, the second one, is for the first season, so Utobi Swim Club. Um, these ones here, I can put this away. This box actually came with, it fits two in here because I took out the case for the drama CDs and stuff. So, you know, I just repackaged as I do. Fear not, the drama CDs are just in the other room uh, because I like to house them together as per my general proclivities. Uh, these ones are the ones for Free Eternal Summer, so season two. Um, see, here we have the the um, drama CDs, but inside we have more artwork. I'm not going to flick through the other one, but they're basically the same thing just for artwork for season two. Um, and I don't think, may oh, maybe. So here's the cover of season two. So we got Rin and Sosuke. Um, then we have this one, which is another one that Animation Do or Kyoto Animation put out for uh season two the movies um so i'm waiting on the season three one basically is, is what i'm trying to get at next is jiro tanaguchi's art book 
which is beautiful, a collection of a bunch of his works, which is always good stuff. Some of his quiet stuff, some of his really weird sci-fi stuff. Yeah, I mean, phenomenal creator, phenomenal artist um, who has since passed on. But really happy that I was able to get that art book. And it is heavy, like it's heavy on hardcover. Next to that is the Tagami Bachi art book, Shine. I don't even necessarily like Tagami Bachi a huge amount, but I love Asada's art style. I love his color work. Oh my gosh. There's nothing inherently wrong with um, Tagami Bachi. I just, I didn't love it as much as other people do, I think. Um, but I love the color. I just love his coloring. And blues and purples, like that kind of is such, like that's exactly my thing. This is his other art book. Um, this is just like general illustrations um, that he put out. I'm going to be a little bit careful because it's kind of... There can be a little bit of nudity and stuff in here. Yep, like that one. Um, this is one of his other series. Um, I'll see KBC Basketball Club, something like that. Um, so a lot of artwork from there, but also just kind of his general artwork, which is pretty cool. And really happy to have that. Yeah, as I said, I'm not necessarily a huge fan of his manga, but I do really like his art. Which is why I have his art books and not his manga. Um, next is the Viz release of the complete art of Fullmetal Alchemist, which collects all three volumes of art book stuff, um, a la Hiromurakawa's art books. This is just the English language release of the Japanese release, which is pretty much the same, has a different art cover. Uh, then we have the two Solider Soul Art books. Um, by Atsushi Okubo. I like Okubo's style. I think there's a lot of real creativity and I, I really, Soul Eater has some really interesting ideas, but oh man, I said with earlier, um, I Okubo does not know how to write a story without inserting unpleasant fan service that I find a pain to read um he and it kind of actively ruins some of his stories unfortunately um even soul eater i'm like oh that was meant to be a like a major final fight and really dramatic and uh, important and intense and then you gotta cheapen it with some boob shots i don't know why you do that sir and then soul eater soul art 2 is basically same thing uh it it has more of the from the main series, but then also Solid or Not, which is kind of the spin-off series. Next to that is my second uh, copy of the Nabaru no O art book, which has the Animate Limited slip cover, so you can see like so. And I think I did an art book overview for this one, but yeah, love it. Phenomenal. Kamatani. I love your work and I love this series. So when I found a copy of this art book with the animate slip, I was like, hey, I'm going to buy that, especially because it was like $12. So it's not even like I spent a huge amount on that. Next is the Tanari no Kabutsukun illustration book or My Little Monster art book, which is Robiko's art book. Oh my goodness. I will pick that up in a minute, um, which is as the name implies, a bunch of artwork from My Little Monster, a fun shoujo series about two very, um, two very <laughs> interesting characters who shouldn't necessarily be in a relationship, um, but how they grow and become better suited for each other and mature to a point where they, sh they would, are, would work better in a relationship. Oh my goodness. Okay, this, I'll pull this one out there first because I don't know why this is here. So this is not actually technically an art book, but this is a Daisuke Igarashi, um, well, it's a picture book that he illustrated, which is beautiful. It's basically an art book and it captures a lot of his ocean scenery um, that I was gushing about with Children of the Sea. And this is 
I don't know. I haven't read it because I cannot read Japanese, but oh, there's like weird mermaid things that are very manta rays and it's it's beautiful. It is beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Really, really lovely. I bought that with the help of somebody who uh, very kindly offered to send me a copy um, from where he was living in Japan and I was very happy to take him up on that offer. Next is the Pandora Hearts Odds and Ends. This is I think another Animate Limited where it comes with a couple of different posters and things. There we go. And maybe the slip cover. This is one of the art books, oh my gosh, that did get a um, English release from Yen Press. But I mean I don't I just bought the Japanese release before Yen even put out this release. I mean, as you can imagine, this uh, this contains artwork from Pandora Hearts and also Crimson Shell, which is this one. Um, I really like this art book because it really uses the cutouts here. Like, oh my gosh. Then you can see, oh my gosh. Um, which is pretty cool. I wish more art books did that, but it's not, uh, you know, it's not a necessity, um, but it is a pretty cool, pretty cool thing. Now let's fix this. Ugh, ugh, because we've got the next Pandora Hearts art book, which is for the second half of the series or the later parts of the series. I mean, again, just beautiful color pieces from Pandora Hearts. I think I've done an art book every for both of these books. So if you want, to look into them further. I have a whole playlist of all of the different art book overviews I've done so you can get a better look at this rather than me spending forever flipping through each book um, in a great detail. detail. Next is um, <laughs> Natalia Axe of Power's art book. This is the first one, Art Stella, um, which just has character artwork of, um, you know, the various characters slash countries of Hitalia. And if nothing else, for all of the issues of Hit that I have with Hitalia, um, Himuruya uh, Hidekaz um, has a really appealing art style. Like, I really like his character designs. And, you know, I, I'm allowed to have my dark, weeby past. Uh, and then this is the second art book from Hitalia, which is Arsol, um, which again, pretty much the same thing and I I like these books because there's certain points where um, with the chibis they'll have all of the different characters that he all the different countries that he's designed um, and if you're a nerd who followed Italia for way too long like me you can name them all um, and I like that in, at least in the comics, there was countries that didn't show up in the anime, or like not didn't show up in the anime for a long time. Couldn't show up in the anime because of uh, <laughs> political tensions, things like that. Like there's a Korea and a Romania and a Thailand, and all of these other characters, which are like countries. But because Japan is just the worst sometimes when it comes to countries, um, there they weren't included. Um, where Here's Australia. Australia right there. I always, I always liked Australia. I mean, I live in Australia, that's why. But like, I don't know, it was just appealed to me that Australia existed. And so did New Zealand. He is down here. Look at him with his curly sheep hair. Um, yeah, interesting, interesting, interesting. But oh my god, Hitalia is a blast from the past. Not something I revisit very often, <laughs> if at all. Uh, next is the Mushishi art book. This is super duper out of print. I was super lucky to buy it when I did. And obviously contains artwork from the series. Oh my gosh, some of the most beautiful pieces ever. Um, again, I did an art book overview of this one, so if you want more in-depth look at this, then head on over there. But oh, it's so gorgeous. I love it so much. As per expected of me, who loves Mushishi just in general so much. Next is, oh my gosh, another favorite. This is my Descending Stories art book. So Haruko Kumata, her work. Um, a bunch of stuff from Descending Stories. That is the main theme 
for this this art book and it is so beautiful did i do an art book i reference for this one i don't remember yes i did i did i remember because i remember taking the photo for the the thumbnail which is a weird thing to remember and then these are um this is from the great passage which is a wonderful anime and i don't know if these are from the novel who knows but it's because she did the character designs for the series i'm pretty sure it's not a manga it's a novel um and i think the anime character designs were based off of her stuff and then we've got some of just her other stuff oh a little bit of her bl stuff but most of her bl stuff is in her bl centric art book I really like her art style, unsurprisingly, and this art book is beautiful. And I don't know if you can still get it, but I would highly recommend it from Mandarake if you're looking for it. Next is, oh, Ayakano from, so this is the art book for uh, Requiem of the Rose King. And whole man, art is gorgeous. This is another one where I've done the art book overview for it, I'm pretty sure. Uh, so, oh, oh, I love it. Beautiful, 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 beautiful. I love just the vibrancy of the color work and the detail of these pieces. The composition. Oh, they're pieces of artwork. Oh, I love this one of Henry. <sighs> yeah, uh, needless to say, I gain a lot of joy from my art books, especially for series I adore, like this one. Uh, yeah, phenomenal phenomenal book next is oh this is probably one of my oldest art books that i have this is for spice and wolf the original 17 uh light novels and oh beautiful i really like um ayokawa's yeah ayokawa's um art art style i really like the the artwork of the novels i think it is very very beautiful i think it captures the setting very well as well there is more recent art books for um this series but they are very out of print and hard to find so i i, I do not own any of them but this one is a pretty it, it has majority of majority of the stuff that i'm interested in anyway next is a english release of a art book this is the uh d gray man art book notche by Katsura Hoshino. So this is just various artwork from D. Gray Man, which is a series that I kind of follow. Like whenever it's off of hiatus, I kind of read the newer stuff, but I read a solid chunk of it, like 20 volumes in fairly quick succession. And then I took a break and then I went, by the time I got back to it, I forgot everything. I was like, oh, what is going on? Who are these people? I need to reread it at some point. But it is a really interesting, solid, like, action series with a supernatural element. I think it, it the, the fact that it went on hiatus and is still currently, like, always on and off of hiatus kind of hurts its popularity. But it was super duper popular for a long time there. Um, kind of catching the, the hype train, the wave of interest from shonen of this type when you know full male alchemist the original stuff was being was big and interesting and i think it's of that era i'd like to see this end someday um and that's not to force hoshino to finish her work but um like with most manga all manga i i always as i said i i will never begrudge a creator their hiatuses um, and their need to to rest, but it like on the other hand, it is nice to see an ending for these series. If they can finish their works whilst keeping their health good, that's all I need. But yeah, it's an interesting story, and I do need to reread it. Like it's not one that I'd buy, but this art book I do like, and it was very cheap um, from a local retailer because they were getting rid of all of their manga stuff, and I got it for very very cheap. Next, oh my gosh if it would stop falling over first is shooting star bebop which is the first of four art books for this uh, artist and this contains as you can see here a majority durara stuff 
Oh my gosh. So we got a bunch of Durara from the light novels and various you know, promotional things, which is to be expected. And then some other, like, spin off Durara stuff, art, not art books, <sighs> light novels, and then just, yeah, as per expected for a um, particular artist, they, they have their spin-off and fan stuff as well. And then we have uh, Shooting Star Carnival, which is the follow-up, which is Yosakura Quartet, which is a manga series that they work on. Um, and you can buy digitally. Uh, you can buy the first, like, eight or something volumes in print, but they're old Del Rey releases. These are... It is available up-to-date, like, old 20-something volumes from Kodansha. Um, digitally. So this is a bunch of their work on that series and of course other series. They've got a pretty striking style. I like how they draw character eyes which might be a bit weird thing to say but yeah this that's an interesting thing. They do also have a um, D and E one as well which I do not own um, which I do hope to get. So here's the I also have the three uh, Japanese single releases for Fullmetal Alchemist. So this is basically all of the artwork that's in the new um, Viz release, like complete artwork works set, and also the Japanese release. But this is the first one that came out ages and ages ago. Uh, the second one looks like this, and the third and final one came out way later after those ones, um, and is like the last part of the story. Um, and I've done art book overviews for all of those as well, so you can dive into them properly there. Next is um, Pseudomorph of Love, which is uh, Haruko Ichikawa's art book for Land of the Lustrous. Oh, it's so beautiful. Oh, I talked about how, how much I love the art style for Land of the Lustrous and just Ichikawa's work in general. And never is it more striking than when you can get an art book and you just oh look how beautiful that is it's phenomenal and then here's some more art pieces for her uh, short story collections and stuff oh I love it man I love her her interest like she does such cool um, like body horror stuff as well which is totally my thing <laughs> like this in particular is like oh it, it's really like it, some people may be grossed out by that but I find it really appealing there's a way to do that without being um, you know scary oh just look at that look at that it's so phenomenal it's like movie stills I don't know it's just entrancing and then speaking of um, Land of the Lustrous. This is the animator, like the animation studios art book for for this series. So all of the artworks that they did in preparation to make the series. Look how beautiful that is. So again, like the series is phenomenal as an anime, and this is all of the art direction, all of the what they would have used to visualize making this series. It's so amazing. And I think you can only buy this from their online shop, which is how I bought it. Totally worth, totally worth the money. Absolutely phenomenal. Look how striking that is. And if you're an artist, uh, just, I, I do really recommend just how this book, just to see how they compose shots and how they use these silhouettes and just oh it's so oh it's so beautiful yeah needless to say I'm a big fan and Orange if they put out another art book for Land of the Lustrous or any of their like titles that they work on um their recent ones being um what is it called uh Beastars like I'd be all over that sounds like a good time uh and then we have Yu Hakusho, this is the only of Togashi's works that has an art book, I believe. And, I mean, it's just 
a bunch of Yee Hawkshire artwork. Again, another one that I've done an art book I review on. Oh, I love, I love, um, I really like the 90s styles. This is, so this is all artwork from 1990 up until 1994, and then I think the later part is, um, stuff that he did afterwards, like after Yee Hawk Show was finished. Um, and you can kind of see how it changed. Uh, but yeah, some really, really great stuff. Yeah, you can see here. Um, 2004 to 2005, which is kind of the more recent stuff. And then later is the 1990 to 1994. So a bit of a gap, but really interesting to see see all of his works and to see how his art style changed as well over a, a decade. Um, oh my gosh. Then we've got Bacchino art book, which is basically, as it says, um, different artists for Bacchino compared to Durarra. And I really like um, the Bacchino artwork. I think that this particular artist really grew over the course of the series. And yeah, there's some phenomenal pieces. Plus, I'm just a big sucker for Bacchino. I think it has a great cast of characters. It's very fun. And I think uh, they're very well designed and striking. It works very well for the setting. And I think they they did a good job as an illustrator. But yeah, so we have that one, which is a hardcover. This is another one of my like first art books that I ever got. And I think this is a Mandarake purchase. Either that or eBay. I don't know. It has been so long. And then finally is the Taya Matsumoto art book. Um, which is wonderful, 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 wonderful. This is the more recent of his art books, I believe. He has a couple others. But a bunch of stuff for um, just various different things. And I love the different art styles. I mean, this really showcases Taya Masumoto's differing styles and his, his wonderful versatility. I just, I adore it. I adore it. And you can see there's a bunch of cats of the Louvre here. Oh, it's so good. I'm pretty sure there's some sunny stuff in here. There's ping pong in black and white. So yeah, you get like a bunch of everything in here. Definitely worth picking this one up if you are a fan of his titles. There's sunny and there's more sunny. There's some great stuff in here and I highly recommend it. It's very, 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 very good. And that's it. I'm going to have to put all of these art books back into here, but I do have some more to show off, so it shouldn't be too long. Give me a second. Next, apologies for lighting in this room, but it is a different setup from the other room. Um, so this one is volumes one to 15 plus the extra volume of Mars by Fuyumi Sorio. This is a highly dramatic uh, teen romance story about a quiet, shy, good girl artist and her love affair with a pretty bad boy motorcyclist who skips class and all these other things. It's very good. Um, this was released by Tokyo Pop, so 1 to 15 plus Horse with No Name, which I think is, it's, it has the Mars title on it, but I don't remember how it plays into the series itself. It might not even play into the series. I don't know. Who knows? Um, but this, this is an older series. It's very out of print, but you can read it in its entirety digitally, legally, from Kodansha, it's on Comixology and Kindle and stuff like that. So get, give it a give it a look. It's well, it's it's very much like the dramatic teen love story, um, I, but it does have kind of darker elements to it. I I think it really builds to something pretty interesting, and it's kind of a classic. A lot of people. Um, I think for a lot of people this was their first experience with a lot of the darker themes in shoujo manga. And it, it also has a somewhat more mature relationship than a lot of other high school 
what high school romance series that you see nowadays it's very 90s which is not a bad thing <laughs> but my books are kind of a little bit beat up they're a mix of um and i think they're all i bought them all from the same seller but they're all various levels of library quality so do with that what you may or maybe i piece them together i don't know it is hard to it is hard to get this series in its entirety in print not impossible but you're not going to find any new um new books in perfect quality unless you buy them directly from a seller who is, or a, someone who's really looks after their books and is downsizing their collection or a relative's collection or something uh, but yeah, really interesting one, and one that I would recommend you read, but through digital means, legal digital means, if you so wish, um, and maybe try it out that way before dumping a whole bunch of money into it, because as I said, it is older, it is out of print, and it's not like the most, like, I don't think it's a must read, but it definitely is iconic for this era of manga, and it's a pretty fun time. Uh, fun being relative. Next is, or finally for my more normal quote-unquote manga, is Otomen, uh, the complete series 1 to 18. This is Ayakano's earlier work about a high school um, boy and girl. It's a like a rom-com series, but our main character, the guy, is what is regarded as an otomen, um, and so he's a guy with girly interests, but he's also, uh, he has to hide his interest in girly things, cooking and sewing and cute desserts and stuffed animals and whatever, because his mother, and this, this show is like kind of of its age, it hasn't age super duper well but I do think it does some interesting things um and I do think it has some kindness towards some of the issues um that you don't see a lot of in manga of this era and I think that echoes in her more recent work uh, Requiem of the Rose King but uh this our main character he has to hide all of his girly um inclinations because his mother is incredibly strict on him being like the perfect man because his dad left the family, left um, his the just hit the mother and himself um, because he, or should I say she, didn't feel comfortable being a man anymore. So there's obviously the uh, what the the manga doesn't really have the language for because of its age is is that his his father is a transgender woman so um the mother kind of gets really upset over this and has kind of a, a crisis and a mental breakdown and so she's very forceful about her son being like a true man a man's man whatever else which is not cool um, but he slowly learns to be more comfortable with his so a girly interest be after befriending and later kind of romantically getting involved with a girl in his school who is kind of a real tomboy bit of a brute she really likes fighting she was her dad raised her in a dojo so she's very like into martial arts she's very strong and so and she's not afraid to like be herself and it encourages him to be himself and so there's a lot of really interesting explorations of gender and gender expression in this story, which haven't aged perfectly, just because I don't think any shoujo manga of this era has aged perfectly. I think there's a lot of issues with it, but I do think it's better than most. And I will say that the way that they handle the trans character in this, or what is implied to be a trans character, um, being our main character's dad, um, is really, like, is, has, is way more empathetic than I would expect, and it's done fairly well, so it's not like, I wouldn't recommend this to everyone, but if you like a lot of the gender stuff in Ayakano's more recent work, 
you probably enjoy this one. It is very funny. It's it, it's a pretty solid rom com in its own right as well. Just by the by, um, and so it is pretty entertaining. Uh, somewhat problematic, but pretty fun regardless. And it's interesting to see how similar themes show up in mangaka's works, despite being kind of totally different from each other. It's a it's a pretty cool thing to see. Next we have some display figures, first being uh, Hinata and Kageyama from Haikyuu. These are both prize figures. Um, they would have been, well, prizes in like a, not a gachapon, that's not the right, claw, claw machine game. And they're really nice, they're really big as well for their price, really highly detailed. Um, probably the best prize figures for these characters and uh, definitely worth the money if you can track them down. They're a little bit older now, now though at this point. More prize figures for Haikyuu with the two managers from Karasuno. Um, yeah, I, I really appreciate that they, for this line of prize figures, they even made the girls, which is not always a common practice for a uh, male sport series. I love both of these girls. Um, they're really great characters. They're really fleshed out. They really add a lot to the series. And uh, and not just like as a romantic interest because neither of them are really uh, romantic um, focus for these characters, which is pretty cool. I, yeah, they, I, I think um, if you can track them down, because I don't necessarily think these are two would be super hard to find. But this whole line is pretty good. Um, I didn't buy them just because I have Nendroids and stuff, but uh, they're they're adorable and they they pose pretty well together. I just put them on a, a different base, one of the Nendroid bases, because their actual bases are big and bulky, and I wouldn't be able to pose them together if I used them. So, just a bit of my ingenuity and and engineering for these two. Just a bit of an aside, but I've actually pulled these out of my car just the other day because I'm selling that car. It, well, I'm scrapping that car, but I actually have, oh my God, they're so beat up because they've been my, in my car for months, but I have the soundtrack and the insert song uh, collection for Euro and Ice. So this is the soundtrack, um, which is all of the music from the show, including, um, you know, some of the stuff that is probably recognizable as just like actual music for the show not the insert songs and then I have the insert song collection which I have I owned before that this was released before that and this is all of the different skating songs for the various skaters in Yuri and Ice and this is the one I listen to the most because well why wouldn't you it's got all of my favorite tunes from one of my favorite shows and it's a good CD. It's really interesting to see the diversity of music in the show just through the music like this. Um, no, diversity of the performances, I should say. Diversity of the music. Diversity of the performances. Um, and that, I think, is... No, one more thing to show off. And then uh, I'm done with this video. Hooray! Oops, I lied. Two more things. We have uh, these two little prize figures. I'll bring them up to the light because they're kind of hidden in the darkness here. We have... Nagisa and Rei, little child versions, obviously, to go with uh, Makoto and Haru and all the various uh, Rin and Sosuke as well. There's this, it was a set of six, well, it was a set of eight, but six unique ones, plus an alt face version, plus a uh, uh, duplicate. And I had got a duplicate Makoto and I got an alternate face Rin with a, like, a cheesy grin or a wink or something, I can't remember. Uh, but these two are in here, not for any particular reason, just, you know, they suit better in here, I guess. Finally, this technically is like a light novel thing, but it, it's more display. I have the Anniversary Collector's Edition, a uh, 10 year Anniversary Collector's Edition of the 17 Spice and Wolf volumes in the one hardback leather bound whatever uh, edition for this this release, I also have um, my only holo scale figure. There's been a lot of holo scale figures, but this one's definitely my favorite, although she is naky. Um, I do think it, it captures her likeness pretty closely, and I like I think it's a pretty um, 
I think it actually captures her pretty well, and her nudity is pretty tastefully done as per the novels, and then that's just like a little um, paperweight. But this is my Spice and Wolf section, and when I show off my actual light novels, you'll see the the like proper books that I read for Spice and Wolf. But that's going to be next video. I'm going to do a separate video for my um, light novels, just in general, and also a separate video for my BL, just because there are things that are pretty specific. So if you want to watch it, you can just go ahead. But if you're not interested, then you don't have to watch. So hopefully that'll appease everyone. Uh, but thank you guys so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.